Can you just see if anybody's outside? Mm -hmm. Call them in just so that they know we're going to get started. Good, thanks. Thanks. Um, we're just going to check and make sure, see if anybody's outside before we get rolling here. So, first of all, on uh, behalf of uh, Merrick and Cap Powell and uh, actually Monica Kraft, uh, you know, want to thank everybody for coming and taking some time to together. It's funny, you start these things and we've We've done things similar to this, these startups, and they begin with nine or 10 people in a room. And before you know it, the entire room is filled. And I have a feeling that with something like this, over the course of time, the room will be filled, uh, largely because uh, there's a need for studying epithelial biology, the airway. We have clusters of people, you know, uh, now with Allison May on board doing sinus work all the way down to Apollo doing lung transplant work and and everything in between. And so the you know the idea behind this is to pull people together because there's a gap, I think, um, in in epithelial biology, immunology as it relates to just about everything we do. Um, Monica Kraft is going to be joining us, um, and she's going to be, she's probably with us now on, on Zoom uh, from Arizona as the chair of uh, medicine. And, and as I think all of you know, she's a, an icon in the field of uh, research in this area. And so the, the idea um, of bringing everybody together, so first of all, thank you all for coming. We're gonna stay on schedule because people have busy schedules and just to take the time out to be here is really, really critical. Um, but very briefly before Dr. Nessler gets up, the, the whole purpose of this is, is actually simple. It's to bring people together, to introduce collaborations, to see what science is going on in the epithelial world and to develop it, to grow it. There's nothing, you know, in my world, nothing more exciting um, than, than the, the research that we do. The clinical stuff we love, but how do we take this stuff from the real scientific benches and, and actually make them happen in patients. And that's the whole purpose of what we need to do. That's what Mount Sinai is great at. And so we, we need to we need to leverage that and make that happen. I was outside talking, um, you know, we're going to have lectures on how do you how do you commercialize this stuff? How do you take stuff that's that's really important on the bench and, and bring it into companies and bring it into clinical trials? So we will run lectures kind of on a, you know, whatever that is, a monthly, quarterly, whatever we decide as a group, and 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 focus on these things that are really important. So the purpose of today, simply put, is to introduce collaborations. Um and and get this thing off and running because we're super excited about it. So Dr. Nessler is here to briefly introduce the group and then we'll get started. So Eric, thanks. Thanks very much, Eric. First of all, I have to say, this is my first time back in Davis Auditorium in over uh, two years. So it's really a great milestone. Welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a milestone also for the creation of our newest research institute. And what the institutes do at Mount Sinai is to bring together individuals, um, uh, researchers, uh, clinical research, basic researchers, clinical researchers, and physicians and other clinicians to come together to better understand the pathophysiology of disease. And as Eric just mentioned, to really drive that new knowledge toward an improved diagnostic structure, treatment, and prevention regimen for our patients. Uh, the newest institute is the Airway Sciences Institute, and it really does bring together a focus of strength that we've had at Mount Sinai for some time, where we feel we have left synergies on the table. And we're hoping that uh, with Eric's leadership and all of your involvement, uh, you'll be able to capture many of those synergies. When I think of Airway Sciences, I think of uh, it being a perfect focus for an institute. It involves, uh, as Eric said, epithelial biology, uh, tissue structure and biomedical engineering, uh, immunology, uh, cancer, uh, and many other features. Uh, Tim's affiliations, I was looking at the slide, kind of an, an embodies the kinds of interactions that we'd like you all to achieve. In addition to the 
entities uh, listed on Tim's affiliations. Uh, we also have the Lipschultz Immunology Institute, the Pulmonary Medicine Divisions in the Department of Medicine and in Pediatrics as well, um, among uh, many others uh, too. So congratulations to you all for putting this together. We look forward to seeing a lot of exciting science and a lot of exciting science leveraged for the benefit of our patients. It looks like a spectacular program. Unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to run to my 9 a.m. meeting, also in real life somehow, and uh, hope you have a great and exciting day. So thank you for having me and best of luck today. Thank you. So first of all, I have to thank um, uh, Carrie Feeney for organizing. Uh, this was uh, uh, no small task, and uh, I'm sure that um, you've all seen uh, many of her emails, and she was able to corral us all together. So thank you very much for that. And also, thank, um, I must thank the organizers of this institute for inviting me, because I'm not an obvious choice, considering I work mostly in the eye. Um, but uh, eye health does affect airway health. Like for example, uh, influenza can be transmitted to, um, to the airway through the eye and then vice versa, um, eye health can be affected by uh, airway health. So for example, this um, infection, iritis, infection of the, the iris can be, infect, can be uh, resolved with a tonsillectomy. So, um, we began to get interested in the ocular surface uh, primarily when the pandemic began. Uh, one of the questions we had was whether or not the eye could be a uh, entry portal um, to infection and whether or not the eye can be directly affected uh, by SARS-CoV-2. And so men, uh, the, the real connection between um, the eye is through the, uh, lac and the airway is the lacrimal uh, duct. And, um, and so, as you can imagine, uh, anything that passes through the eye can, can lead to the nasal cavity and so on. Uh, most of this work was done by uh, this very talented postdoc, uh, Anne Zabitz Erickson, that led the work uh, that was started by uh, Bar Makovaz. And through a fruitful collaboration with uh, Ben Tenover and, an, uh, and his uh, talented postdoc Rasmus, or grad student Rasmus Muller, uh, we, we entered into a really fruitful collaboration. And so uh, one of the first things that we asked was for individuals that uh, have passed that were positive with SARS-CoV-2, could we find viral particles on the corneal surface, surface. And so we stained with uh, corneal markers and also antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. And we did find that both the limbus area, which is the area just uh, peripheral to the cornea uh, and the corneal area was uh, viral particles were present on the ocular surface. The next thing that we wanted to do uh, was uh, see whether or not uh, individual cells could be infected. And so, we took normal cadaver donor globes and cultured them and then uh, validated their uh, cell identity and then exposed them to um, typical uh, concentrations of SARS-CoV-2 with, uh, uh, within 24 hours, examined whether or not they uh, can become infected. We also examined them for uh, the uh, hypothesized receptors for SARS-CoV-2, which is ACE2 and Team Paresis 2. And in fact, um, uh, there are some uh, cell types that did express these, these receptors that included um, preferentially the limbus region. Um, and uh, uh, incidentally, this is also the cell type that uh, became uh, most infected by SARS-CoV-2. We then followed that up with uh, conducting uh, RNA, bulk RNA-seq of the ocular surface cells. So uh, included, it included uh, cornea cells, uh, limbus cells, and also uh, scleral cells, hypothesizing that uh, these, uh, of any of the ocular cells, these would be the most likely to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2. And again, we find that, um, that all of the, uh, the cells uh, become infected by SARS-CoV-2. This is the, the sequence that, uh, and the reads that were found in the bulk RNA-seq. Um, the limbus was, again, the most uh, preferentially in infected. And when we look at the gene expression, 
uh, of that was the most significantly upregulated. NF kappa B uh, signaling pathway uh, genes were the most uh, elevated in all three of the tissues or cell types. And, and so we next wanted to uh, confirm that phosphatase activity was in fact necessary for this infection. And so we used TPCK, which is a phosph phosphatase inhibitor, and it did abrogate this infection. And so uh, in using these um, primary uh, uh, cadaver donor uh, models, we found that uh, cadaver donor eyes um, do uh, have um, protein uh, present in the cornea and limbus, and that SARS-CoV-2 seems to have a limbal uh, tropism. And, and so we felt that we needed to find, uh, develop a more tractable model to study this further. And to do this, we took advantage of this stem cell um, model. It's, it's organotypic like where um, pluripotent stem cells uh, spontaneously differentiate into these uh, circumferential regions that uh, directly relate to uh, cell types of the eye. And so from the center, um, cells of the neuroectoderm are specified. In the second uh, zone, uh, cells of the eye field are specified. And then in the third uh, zone, uh, cells of the ocular surface are specified, and then uh, surface, um, and then uh, other ectoderm is specified in the fourth zone. So this is a really useful model to compare uh, infection rates of different cell types uh, on a on a level playing field. And so we took advantage of that, and again exposed. Uh, uh, well, first wanted to look at the uh, different cell types uh, by single cell RNA-seq. And we do find that the cell types that were predicted based on um, qPCR and immunostaining are in fact present, which includes neurocrest derived cells of the, of the eye uh, and neuroectoderm derived cells of, of the eye. And that includes retinal pigment epithelial cells, neural retina, um, but also it includes uh, cells of the ocular surface, so including uh, presumptive limbal cells and cornea cells. We then looked at uh, expression of ACE2 and TMPRSS2 in these cultures, and we do find an enrichment of ACE2 and TMPRSS2 in the regions that specify closely to limbus. And then when we stain for TMPRSS2 and ACE2, we do find co-labeling of these receptors in these uh, regions. We then uh, conducted single cell RNA seq, uh, exposing uh, cells, or these colonies, to SARS CoV 2, and then comparing it to uninfected, and then merged the data. And um, we do find, again, in, similar to in the, in the primary cells, these, uh, there is active uh, replication of SARS CoV 2 found in these cul cultures. Um, uh, both found by uh, sequencing, but also by plaque assay that demonstrates that this is a productive infection. And then again, we find all the different uh, cell types as previously identified, uh, both in the, the healthy uh, seam and the infected seam. We then look to see which cells became infected in these uh, organoid-like models, and we find that uh, we have um, one region that is uh, that that's kind of spurts out of a, a population that has limbal uh, gene expression, and in fact, if you look here, at which we term limbus one and limbus two, they both have the same uh, limbal uh, markers. Um, however, in limbus two, there is a, a much um, uh, higher elevation of infection. And so that suggests that a subpopulation of the limbus cells uh, became infected and that gene expression changed sufficiently to uh, create a completely separate cluster. Now, when we look at the uh, difference in gene expression in um, both the NF uh, kappa B and uh, TNF alpha pathway genes, what we find is those uh, limbus two or those infected with SARS-CoV-2 have a much more elevated NF kappa B um, uh, gene expression, uh, which is similar to the primary cells as well. Um, 
And then when we look at the uh, interferon pathway, what we find is that compared to um, the uninfected uh, Limbus 1 cells, the infected cells have a attenuated interferon response, which is similar to what other um, uh, airway epithelial infections uh, have found. And so um, we think that this, uh, this organoid model is a useful uh, human eye model to study uh, ocular infections. And we have uh, expanded this to not only um, studying SARS-CoV-2, but uh, also uh, have collaborations uh, with uh, others to study influenza and also measles because they both have ocular phenotypes. Um, in uh, July of, uh, of 2021, I was invited to participate in a workshop um, on the ocular microbiome um, because there are technical issues when studying the ocular microbiome and that has to do with low biomass. And so um, there is insufficient material in order to um, uh, accurately quantify and study um, the, the ocular surface. And this low biomass limits the ability to, to, um, to progress very quickly. And so uh, again, uh, and uh, Erickson uh, thought of a model that might be helpful in, in uh, studying uh, this further and um, fell on a 3D model of, of corneal uh, differentiation. And so here are some publications uh, that, that describe some of the protocols that are present in the literature. And so um, the idea is that we would use uh, these corneal organoids uh, in order to um, model the, the ocular surface and then uh, perhaps inoculate these organoids with um, uh, tears uh, and, and with the hope that uh, there, there can be effective, effective growth and, and, um, and that expansion would enable uh, further characterization. And so essentially um, it it's, starts out as any typical 3D organoid uh, does, um, seeding cells in a low um, attachment uh, binding plate, letting them um, spontaneous differentiate, and then nudging them towards corneal maturation, pri primarily through use of a keratinocyte growth factor. And so um, over the course of around 60 days, uh, these organoids grow, and then uh, a, a subset of them will um, have a region that becomes uh, transparent. And so you can see the green through this uh, organoid. And so when we evaluate uh, the cell types that are in these transparent uh, regions, um, it's really remarkable. These, these stainings really show the, the complexity of, of these organoids. And so you can see that, um, that there are multiple layers of, of epithelia, but only the, the outer surface epithelia contains ZO1. And that's exactly what happens in, in corneal development. When we look at other uh, corneal markers, again, just the, the first layer of uh, corneal epithelium expresses keratin-3, whereas the other layers uh, express keratin-15, which is often more associated to limbal, um, limbal uh, uh, cells. Uh, these layers also are PAC6 positive, as expected. And then when we look at uh, uh, stroma marker vomentin, we do find that it is uh, found present uh, primarily in the center region, which uh, has a similar relationship to, to the cornea. Again, um, a limbal marker P63A is found in the, just in the inner uh, epithelial uh, layer um, Co-stain with vomentin uh, really shows this difference. And then lastly, we stain with laminin, which is uh, excitable, um, a membrane marker, and, and it nicely uh, demarcates the stroma and the epithelium, which is um, uh, similar to um, Bowman's membrane. So when we conduct single-cell RNA-seq, we do find a number of um, the uh, clusters that uh, express uh, genes that are associated with corneal epithelium, for example, keratin-12, PAC-6, but also corneal stroma and, um, and corneal endothelium. And so uh, we think that this is a, a useful model to, to study corneal biology.
And, and the, so this is basically where we are right now, and we're looking for collaborators. Um, the, the real objective is to take these organoids and try to develop a liquid air interface. And so if any of you have experience with something like that, then please reach out to me either for collaboration or at least consulting, because this is, this is the direction that we really want to go to. And, uh, and yeah, Anne is um, putting the, making these organoids uh, on a daily basis. So um, there's, there's plenty to go around. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I can take questions. Right. Yeah, this is something that we we have some evidence to suggest that there is a re there may be a reason why the limbo cells uh, are um, are taken advantage of. I, there's some data that I didn't present, but these cells also express a number of um, receptors that have been identified to be exploited by SARS-CoV-2. So that may explain it. Um, but the reason why they have those receptors is really unknown, but it may have to do with the fact that they, they are um, a, a progenitor source and that maybe some, um, some function is, is exploitable uh, because of that. Uh, yes. Um, a similar question. Um, beautiful work, by the way. Um, how much plasticity is there, at least in vitro, for you yeah. Put them in culture with certain conditions versus others. Can you actually generate different sorts of directions? Right. So, can you move towards either cornea epithelium versus the conjunctiva? Yeah, this is something that we haven't really explored too much. We do uh, always study these cells at uh, P1 uh, just to prevent any trans differentiation that occurs in culture as well, or try to. Um, keep it to a minimum. Um, but of course, the longer they're in culture, um, they're trying to move into different fates. And, and so that is something that um, deserves more attention, for sure. And then one of my questions about the organoid model, which is really stunning, um, the initial setup of that model is you're taking tissue, digesting it into single cell suspension, and then taking like the CD45 negative cell. Right, so I, I, I glossed over that a little bit. Um, these are pluripotent stem cells that are then differentiated into, uh, into these colonies. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow up on your question, in, a, in that context, then could you, can you see by single cell analysis that um, you have hedgehog, that's not hedgehog expressing cells because they are in the context of the stem cells and other patterning of <laughs> yes, we do. We do see hedgehog signaling and wind signaling. Yeah. You can really recapture the whole. That's amazing. Yeah, it's very surprising. I even though we didn't um, evaluate uh, corneal endothelium by immunostaining, just the fact that we could annotate it there, it suggests that yeah, we have we have the majority of the cell types we already. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you very much. everybody seen this well. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yaoun Chen. I recently joined Mount Sinai from USC. I started my faculty position in 2019. Unfortunately, one month I, after I had my lab, COVID hits, the entire USC shut down. Uh, so I focused on writing grants, and now um, I decided to move to Mount Sinai for my career. Uh, 
more in advanced because uh, Eric just did the first trachea transplantation and I'm particularly interested in stem cell therapy in trachea transplantation or bioengineered trachea. So since the goal of the symposium today is actually to facilitate stimulant collaboration, I don't want to go into like really details of what we do in the lab, but more just to introduce what kind of lung models we have in the lab and that can uh, be used at the research group at Mount Sinai. So the research in my lab mainly uh, divided into four different parts and I'll be briefly touch the first two parts. If we have time, I'll go into the third parts. Uh, so the first one is how we develop a model that we call it lung organoid model from human pluripotent stem cells and how we can use this model to study human lung development uh, or model some disease. Second is how we can potentially use these lung organoid models for stem cell-based therapy. Uh, my lab is also interested in using this organoid model, uh, combining with bioengineering to try to fix bad lungs or create a new lung SV body for transplantation. Uh, lastly, we just uh, established collaboration with SpaceX and JPL, trying to shoot out lung organoids into the ISS and just to study how the microgravity environment would affect some of the alveolar and the airway cells or how these cells could potentially be damaged by the high speed particle passing through uh, traveling in the universe. So on Earth, the goal of my lab is to uh, mainly differentiate, uh, to generate different types of uh, alveolar and the airway cells from embryonic stem cells or induced polypotent stem, uh, patients induced polypotent stem cells Collectively, we call these two types of cells uh, human pluripotent stem cells. The capacity to do so in vitro could serve as a model to study human lung development, drug screening, as well as disease modeling. And among these diseases, we have used the lung organoid model to model uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and many several different types of respiratory infectious disease, including influenza, pre-influenza, measles, uh, RSV, and of course, the most popular one recently, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, another ultimate goal in the lab is to utilize this in vitro generated alveolar and the airway cells to sit on a deserialized lung matrix to reconstruct a functional lung. And uh, hopefully one day we will be able to transplant this lung back to patients. However, this route still has decades to go since lung is such a complex organ. Alternatively, in the near future, we would like to focus more on utilizing this in vitro generated alveolar and the airway cells to transplant them into patients' injured lung or trachea, and hopefully these cells will be able to help the patient to repair their lung and to regain their lung function faster. So to achieve these goals, I have developed a model during my POSTA uh, that allows us to systematically differentiate from human pluripotent stem cells to definitive endoderm to anterior polka endoderm, and eventually to a structure that we call it lung organoids. So this model produces a three-dimensional structure in submerged cultural conditions first. And then once you embedded the organoids inside the matrix gel, you can see they generate this massive branch morphogenesis. If you follow the arrows, you can actually see them bifurcating inside the gels. When we transplanted the lung organoids under the kidney capsule of immunodeficient mice, one and a half months post-transplantation, we saw this uh, multiple luminal structure showed up in the outgrowth, lined up by pseudostratified epithelial cells surrounded by smooth muscle cells. So this is very resemble to developing human airway. Five months post-transplantation, we saw air areas resemble airway-like structure and the uh, branch morphogenesis showed up. In the airway-like structure areas, we saw uh, CC10 crop cell markers, also some mucin, goblet cells markers, and FOXJ1 multi-ciliated cell markers. The 82 cell markers, surfactant protein B and the surfactant protein C, can only be detected at the tips of the branching, indicating these lung organoids can generate proximal distal uh, specification in vivo. Seven months post-transplantation, we started to see areas resemble alveolar-like structure showed up. In these areas, we were able to detect both 81 and 82 cell markers. In the airway-like uh, areas, we saw beautiful uh, airway epithelium cells, you know, including multi-CD80 cells, goblet cells, club cells, 
we were also able to detect uh, neuroendocrine cells in there, as well as some mucosa gland, which is a key feature for a human airway. So all this data shows that the lung organelle model can mimic human lung development, both in vitro and in vivo, and can be used for, to study human lung development. Uh, in terms of disease modeling, we have used this model to uh, study idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So we introduce a mutation that will cause uh, IPF in the patients. And then here you can see that when the cells has harvested the mutation, you see the, they develop into this dense capturized uh, phenotype that, you know, with a lot of mesenchymal cells in there. Uh, we were also able to uh, model several different types of uh, infectious disease. Uh, and interestingly is that these organoids actually uh, recapitulate the phenotypes we saw in human, that which is the 2D cultures cannot do. For example, for the ISV infection, you saw the infected cells got slopped into the luminal space. Uh, we could also use this model to study uh, injury and repair. For example, when we treated the organoids with bleomycin, we could induce either synesis or we increase the dose or exposure time to induce apoptosis. So we have a collaboration with David Larger at Harvard. He has a drug that's specifically targeting synesis 82 cells. So he was trying to find a human model to test the efficacy of his uh, drugs. So this is one of the collaboration. Uh, that's ongoing. Uh, I didn't put it here, but we also have another collaboration that we're trying to model lung cancer. So we have more than 10 to 15 P53 mutant lice or RB mutant lice uh, in the lab right now. So we are going through differentiating them towards lung and see if we can potentially capture the first initiation of cancer formation uh, by single cells and other methods. So the second part that my lab is interested in is to use these organoids for stem cell therapy. So one of the biggest challenges in stem cell based therapy is to generate a sufficiently large quantity of progenitor cells of the appropriate mature cell types for transplantation. As you can imagine, humans, it's a, it's a huge mass compared to mouse. So you can generate sufficient cells in the lab to transplant into the mouse, but it's uh, relatively technically difficult. Uh, to generate uh, human enough cells for human transplant. So we now have a two protocols in the lab that we can expand to lung, two types of lung progenitors from the lung organoids. The first one we call them putative distal tip progenitors because the phenotype, the, uh, the RNA seq uh, comparison puts them very similar to the developing putative distal tip progenitor. So this is the progenitors by far the most potent one during the lung development. It can actually differentiate into both proximal lineage, which is the airway, and the distal lineage, the alveolar epithelial cells. So these cells can be easily grow and expand, freeze and thaw, and ship to anywhere in the world. And the other cell type that we have is what we call basal-like cell type. So this is more like a basal airway uh, stem cells. So for the putative distal tip progenitor, one of the advantage is that it can actually grow from one cell to one trillion cell cells within 150 days. So if you need a lot of cells for human transplant, you just need to start it with a few more cells. Uh, these cells can be pushed further differentiated into both proximal and the distal type in vitro. And when we took the, the epithelialized red lung, and then we transplant this putative distal tip progenitor into the red lung. 40 hours after incubation in the bioreactor, we saw uh, we have a pretty good human cells reconstitute in the red lung. And you can see these cells attached to the denuded uh, extracellular wedges very well and started to get flattened out. We also see them, uh, saw them started to lose the progenitor markers indication of uh, differentiation. Uh, we also transplanted these cells into the injured immunodeficient mouse lung. We saw, we, again, we saw a very good amount of human cells reconstitution after three weeks post-transplantation, both in the distal area in, and in the airway uh, areas. However, we lost the cells six months post-transplantation. Uh, we don't know if it is because the mouse immune system slowly cleaned it out, or it just that the human cells are not uh, fit to survive in the mouse lung. Uh, 
for the basal like cells, uh, they were they are also able to be differentiated into all sorts of uh, airway epithelial cells, including multiciliated cells, goblet cells, and club cells uh, in on the AOI culture. Uh, what the lab is more focusing on is to use these basal like cells to sit on a deep epithelialized trachea. And here you can see that these basal like cells actually uh, engraft onto the, the epithelialized trachea and the proliferate very well on the trachea. So this is a hormone mouse trachea image uh, after seven days post seeding. And we also try to transplant these uh, basal like cells into the injured immunodeficient mouse lung. Uh, sadly, we didn't see a good human cells reconstitute in, in, the, uh, in the mouse lung three weeks post transplantation, but we saw the human cells actually showed up in the submucosa gland six months post transplantation. We don't know why uh, at this moment. Uh, so, like I said, the lab right now is more focused on the trachea and the airway reconstitution. It also aligns uh, very well with my interest and the interests of the department. Uh, what we want to do is that we actually already have a system developed that we can just remove the epithelial cells from the trachea, and then we're going to sit them with the in vitro differentiated basal like cells and then culture them in a bioreactor for how many days we want to generate a bioengineered trachea. Of course, the next step is that we want to transplant it back to either orthotopically back to the trachea uh, region or heterotopically to the greater omendon just to see if this uh, in vitro generated basal cells could actually really differentiate to the cell type we want at the right location, perform the right function in vivo. So maybe like just quickly, another thing that I'm interested in is actually generating bioengineered lung uh, to use the lung organoids to fix bad lung or make new lungs. So this is a huge team effort. So I'm only playing a small part in this project. It includes thoracic surgeon, you know, our bioengineers, stem cell biologists, vets, and nurses. So here, actually, we use a PIC model uh, that we establish a platform uh, model that we call cross circulation. Basically, uh, we're trying to savage uh, the donor's lung that deemed for not qualified for transplantation, and because we know lung actually has tremendous capacity to repair themselves, so we thought about that maybe if we give the lung a little bit more time to recover themselves and they might be able to uh, qualify for transplantation again, but then we need to find a method to maintain the lung ex vivo. So this is the method we came out eventually. Basically, we are connecting the ex vivo lung with a recipient circulation system to support the, uh, the ex vivo lung. And in the meantime, the lung also got connected with a ventilator providing the oxygen to the recipient. So here is the setting of the surgical room. Uh, surgical room. This is the first generation of cross circulation. Here you can see the, the oxygenated lung coming up from the recipient to the ex vivo lung and got reoxygenated back to the, the recipient. So for the first generation of uh, cross circulation, we will only be able to maintain the lung ex vivo up to 36 hours. That's the maximum time allowed in our protocol. And we show that we can uh, rescue the donor lungs that's marginally disqualified for uh, transplantation. However, if you want to um, recover more severe damaged lung, you need to maintain the lung ex vivo for a longer time. So we then end up uh, came out with a cross circulation platform 2.0. And this time we decided to wake up the recipient. So. Here you can see that this is, a, again, the surgical setting. Uh, you can see the recipient is actually awake, was awake, and that the oxygenated lung, uh, blood came out from the recipient, going through to the ex vivo lung, maintaining a humidified dome, and then got reoxygenated and coming back to the peak. And here's just a video to show you that the recipient was happily playing the ball with the bats. And with this platform, we were able to maintain the ex vivo lung up to five days. Uh, again, that's the maximum times allowed in our protocol. And we show that we, this time we can rescue more severely damaged lung. For example, the lung got damaged by gastric reflex. So now we have the platform established. Of course, the next part is what I'm really interested in the most. 
can we use the stem cells or the lung progenitors we generated in the lab to fix the lung? So this is going to be the next. Uh, we are going to introduce the either the lung organoids or the lung progenitor into the ex vivo lung, and hopefully it can make the chimeric lung for transplantation and repair the lung. And here is just a proof of concept that we can actually deliver the lung progenitor and the lung organoids to the most distal parts of the lung. Uh, with that, I'd like to stop here to thank all my mentors and my collaborator, and especially my people who travel with me from USC, sunny California to uh, New York in January, as well as my funding sources. Thank you. Yes. So, you know, this, this work is, is really fascinating. If you go down to live on New York, you'll find that there's a room there where they have extracorporeal supported kidneys waiting for mm. transplant. And the, the concept of being able to take extracorporeally lung, kidney, any number of these organs, um, support them until transplant, but prepare them. Yeah. Is, a, is an incredible game changer. And, and within grasp, I think. The idea that you can engraft the basal cells into the trachea is a nice method and a mm -hmm. nice model because of the accessibility, the reproducibility, to be able to kind of establish that proof of principle and then move it into a more complex organ structure like lung. Yeah. The one thing I would say is in the research that we had done for years, there's such a difference between orthotopically and orthotopically mm. transplant. Yeah. Because there's so much crosstalk and there's yeah. so much, you know, you know, just kind of uh, interaction with those cells that completely changes the mm. way that these cells behave. Um, but but it is a great model because you can do the orthotopic transplants, you can see that interaction, and now with the kids we have, mm. you can kind of get this figured out. It's a very yes. simple model then to move up the ladder yeah, I agree. So for the epithelialization, we are actually also developing the methods because eventually, hopefully, we will be able to use it in, in the real patients, right? For example, cystic fibrosis patients that we can just epithelialize their uh, airway epithelials and hopefully we transplant the healthy epithelials in there, then the patient can really improve their quality of life further. Yeah. Burn yeah, injury. burn injury. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes. Sure. In the stem cell directed differentiation field, we try to avoid using series. Uh, in vivo, they do have immune system, but in vitro, we don't have immune cells in, in there. We could try to induce immune, uh, introduce immune cells in there, but I am not sure how well they could survive in there. It also depends on the how long you want the experiment goes, right? If it is just 24 hours, 40 hours, I don't think that that would be a problem. But if you are looking for a more long-term effect, then I'm not sure I can find a media that will happily make them both so happy in the market. Um, so I'm interested in the Have you considered these new organ on tube models? Um, like the, so you could have your basal cells lining a tube yeah. similar to the trachea, and then you could have your new cells in another chamber with their own media, and then looking at the interactions that way. We actually thought about that. So the most, the best open on chip uh, manufacturer on the market right now that does lung. If you use the chip to see on the epithelial cells in there, you actually find the epithelial cells either migrate or, you know, kind of move around or migrate into another cell. Right. So I think it's because of the membrane they use. It's different, and they develop the old, the chips based on another organ. Uh, all the coding they use are that actually not the case of the lung. So I do have a friend that who was working on that. She was trying to change the membrane and change the coding. I think she found something that could sort of stabilize basal cells on the top side, uh, but it's still not there. But still not there. 
Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Eric, and all the organizers. I think this is a, is a great opportunity to, to start new collaborations. So we work on, uh, on transplant, on uh, primarily organ transplants, kidney transplants, and uh, the two main goals that we're interested in is to identify new therapeutic targets to improve the, the outcomes of the, of the recipients, but also to optimize the use of the currently available drugs. So normally, the, the, the organ uh, recipients receive an immune suppression that is protocol-based, so it's really not personalized. So we monitor the graft function, and whenever there is a, there's an impairment in the graft function, we do a biopsy, and based on the results of the biopsy, there's a change in the treatment. But of course, this is, a, this is a far from being personalized uh, treatment. It's kind of like if we had to uh, adjust immune suppressive treatment, um, anti-hypertensive uh, therapy based on the fact that patients have hypertension or um, hypotension or, or strokes, for example. We really have nothing um, to, to clearly understand uh, what is the, the, the level of, of autoimmune response. And to understand the more, um, more um, or in detail, what, what, what could be the tools to, um, to titrate the immune suppression is, is critical to understand the immunology of the transplant, which is kind of unique uh, because when a, an organ gets transplanted, there's um, so, uh, immune cells in the organ that can be directly recognized by the recipient immune cells through uh, cross-reactivity, because our immune system is not trained to recognize other MHC or HLAs, but there's some cross-reactivity that allows this, this, this rejection. Um, most of the, of, the, of the autoimmune response, however, is driven by the fact that some of the donor MHC is shed and presented by the um, recipient antigen-presenting cells and presented uh, here with this MHC that is processed. So this is indirect pathway. And more recently has been shown this, that the donor antigen presenting cells can shed directly uh, unprocessed MHC, donor MHC, on the surface of uh, uh, recipient um, HLA. So there's this semi-direct pathway that seems to be also quite, quite important. So this is, this is the biology and the tools that we are, we are, we are, we are, we are developing is our driven by this, they were by this biology. When we started uh, studying uh, T-cell exhaustion in kidney transplant... Ah, sorry, this is... We... So, <laughs> this was me. Uh, so, I don't know what happened. But anyway, uh, so... Um, evolution um, strategies allows to... So there must be something... Okay, sorry. Um, must have been recorded from... <laughs> anyway, so... Um, and this, uh... Okay, so clearly that's not the way to go. Okay, so one way to go is to study the, the immune phenotype. So how do the, the cells in the circulation look like? And one way to do so, uh, we started with, uh, with, with regular uh, flow cytometry, but the cytometry, flow cytometry is limited in the amount of markers that you can analyze at the same uh, time. So we used a uh, site of, and Sinai was one of the first sites uh, having uh, a site of. And this is the example of, uh, of, of a study we did. Um, patients undergo serial biopsy and serial uh, blood samples, and we studied their immune phenotype looking at over 40 markers uh, at different times. This technology allowed to barcode the samples at the, um, together. So to analyze samples from different patients and at different time points all together, which is very important to reduce the, uh, the variability um, that you may have with, with regular uh, flow cytometry. And so you have uh, uh, major um, immune compartments and uh, see how the different clusters change over time. So this allowed us to identify um, a new cluster of cells that emerges over time in patients that have uh, a rejection that doesn't, is not present in patients that don't have rejection that could potentially be um, um, 
an, immune, um, an immune monitoring tool to identify patients that are at higher immunological risk. So this is the immune phenotype. Another thing that we could do is study the, the function of the cells. And the most, uh, the simplest thing is to take the donor cells and the recipient cells um, together. And the recipient cells are gonna start, uh, that are alloreactive, making cytokines, including interferon gamma. The cytokines can be captured at the bottom of the, of the wells where the cells are cultured. And then we can um, practically see and count, enumerate the numbers of spots. And the number of, where, wherever there's a spot, there's a cell that is alloreactive. So counting the number of spots is gonna tell us how many alloreactive cells we have. And, uh, okay. So patients that have a negative LE spot, so we defined a, a threshold of, 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 of positivity, are at lower risk of acute rejection, while the ones that are positive have, uh, um, have higher risk of acute rejection. And this is a meta-analysis of, of uh, multiple studies that also replicate the same finding. However, this LE spot requires the donor cells and they are not always, um, present, it's, it's possible, we can take the cells from the spleen and we're working to develop a, a biobank from our uh, transplant recipients, but it's not always the case. So we can kind of create a, a, a surrogate uh, early spot using surrogate donors. So using other donors that have HLA that is similar to the ones of the real donors that we're using. So in transplant, we call the PRA, uh, is the panel reactivity antibody to, to test uh, the alloreactivity. We call this panel reactivity test against the, the T cells that is telling us the, the alloreactivity of the test. And we saw that the higher is the reactivity, the higher is the PRT, the lower is the graft function at, um, at uh, serially after, after transplant. So this could potentially be, be used to monitor the, the allo uh, immune response. The simplest thing for us uh, uh, nephrologists is to use, uh, to look at the urine. And to look at the urine for the cytokines that are produced by the, by the immune cells. Um, CXCL9 is, uh, is a chemokine that is not really produced by the immune cells. It's produced uh, by the tubular cells in response to the interferon gamma that is produced by the other immune cells. And, uh, um, but this could be used, could be measured not just in the, in the urine, but for example, in the bronchiolar um, uh, lavage, so in other uh, fluids. Um, um, and uh, what we found is that, for example, in patients that have graft dysfunction, and kidney graft dysfunction, the ones that had the highest level of CXCL9 were the ones that actually had acute rejection, because the graft dysfunction not necessarily is uh, immune mediated. Uh, we also checked whether this occurs before the acute rejection, and we saw the patient with high levels that ended up having rejection had higher level before the onset of the rejection. And uh, for us, it's important to have biomarkers that allow us to switch from one treatment to another. For example, this is a study that we did with collaborators in, uh, in, in France. We, uh, these are patients that were on tacrolimus that were moved, switched to these other immune suppressive agents. We serially measured this biomarker. We saw that four patients had higher levels. Then we asked them what happened. We did it malignly, what happened to these patients. And we, the, these are, were the patients that ended up having acute rejection. So it's a very simple test that could be used to monitor the, the reactivity, um, the status of, of, of the graft. And for us it's important because it can also help us monitoring the, the, the resolution of the acute rejection. Sometimes you see in blue, after you treat an episode of acute rejection, like here, you may have normalization of the creatinine, but still if you do a biopsy, you can have infiltrate. So the graft function doesn't, that doesn't necessarily associate with the presence of infiltrates, but still the, this biomarker was high. So indicating that is really capable of detecting an immune response in the graft. Another biomarker that is widely used in the field of transplant in the donor-derived uh, cell-free DNA. So practically the cells of the, of the graft get injured, release uh, DNA. And this has been widely used in, the, in heart transplant uh, recipients, increases before the, the episode of acute rejection. A little less so in, 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 in kidney transplantation. I think the, 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 the AUC for this biomarker is not as good as, as others, but is still definitely better than serum creatinine. It's a little bit better for the antibody-mediated rejection. 
And finally, I think we are interested in, 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 in analyzing the graph biopsies with the new technologies. So currently the graph biopsies is analyzed by, by a pathologist, but you see in the graph biopsies is um, that the, the acute rejection is something that is very focal. You see the, here the, the infiltrates, you see very different structure, you see fibrosis. So um, is, 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 is a focal process and any uh, bulk kind of uh, analysis, RNA um, uh, sequencing, proteomic, would not be able to capture the, the focal nature of the phenomenon. So what we, we've been interested in, in is, was uh, studying the spatial transcriptomics, to so understand the transcriptional profiles of the, of the different areas of the, of the, um, of the biopsy that can be uh, analyzed um, together with this uh, new technology. And practically by doing so, we are able to understand the, the, the genes that are more up or down regulated, but also the variability across the different areas of the, of the biopsy. For example, by doing so, and this is my last slide, we've been able to see that underneath the overexpression of uh, inflammatory genes in an acute rejection biopsy, there's also um, a high variability of genes that belong to the graft that are not super uh, expressed, but are important in, in telling us about the regeneration of the organ in response to the injury. Uh, and we saw a lot of genes that are similar to what we see in uh, acute kidney, uh, kidney injury. So our, our goal will be in the future to, and actually we already start uh, moving into the clinic, to use this biomarker to personalize more the, the immune suppression and to have uh, studies that uh, will test formally uh, the hypothesis that using a biomarker to, to, to take care of the patient to titrate immune suppression will provide better graft uh, outcomes. Thank you for your attention. Yes. That's a really nice talk. It's nice to see the markers of acute rejection being through this biomarker. It's very helpful in the kidney and muscle in the lung. In the lung, the other issue we have is chronic rejection. Half the patients are going to die in five years because of chronic rejection. So, my question is the work that you're doing now, do you see it or is it already extending it to the able model of chronic rejection so that you can put on the lung? So yes, thank you for the for the for the question. So a good thing of this new technology in analyzing the biopsies that they can be used in paraffin on paraffin sections. So on patients whose outcomes are already known. So we can do case control studies to test what's 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 the difference in their transcriptional profile before they develop, like five years before they developed uh, the chronic rejection. So we have uh, um, we and, and actually the the group that was led by by Barbara Murphy was able to identify this signature uh, in kidney transplant recipients. So. Um, in, in, in kidney transplant, we do um, surveillance, but depends on, on the center, but uh, that, that's something that, that is, is done. So we, we can analyze the samples before the patients have the, have the, have the rejection, the chronic rejection. So yes, the data are, are so that we, we can identify patients that are at higher risk. We still don't know, we ne there's, a, a, there's no study that has acted based on these biomarkers to see whether some, some treatments could improve or, um, couldn't increase the outcomes, but yes, that's possible. Great. So as a resource now with the lung transplant program being active here, surveillance files can be done routinely and those specimens can be stored to be made available after the catalytic disease and really make the transfer public disclosure to the lung No, that's and I think that so if you um if you are on board, I think it would be important to also to collect the donor cells. And uh, so that's something that we, we, we can, if we, if we get the, the spleen, they, they can sit. You can't get spleen, but we get, you lymph, can... nodes. We get lymph nodes from the donor lung. Mm. Those are available. Why couldn't we get spleen? Well, typically, everything is assigned to different organs for those different people. Not right, I mean, but now, but how, how much of a difference is there between it's not exactly this. I mean, the donor says, is, wouldn't say it's unreplaceable, but is, is actually something unique. Thank you.
up to be whether and you you get the same spleen versus lymph node big difference. This uh, yes, unfortunately the spleen. Uh, yes. Um, If the, if they are uh, like in in media or in saline, they can stay for like twenty four hours. Uh, so we can we can process them. If, if uh, yeah, there's there's no rush, and we are, we, are, we will collect them from the transplants that are the other kidney and, and and liver transplant that are being done here. And actually, the larger it's a biobank, the easier it is to use surrogate donors that match with the donor. Um, we focus on the HLA, but there's the may, uh, there's also minor uh, histocompatibility complex. So that's why using the real donor has all the the machinery that is that that is that is needed, right? Okay. Yeah. And also the nanosim with the cosmics is, is practically single set, yes. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jamie Hook. I'm in the pulmonary division. Um, my lab's interest is in how viruses and bacteria cause severe lung infection. And a recent project uh, that we finished recently is uh, co-infection by flu and staph. So flu lung infection is a major cause of global mortality. Seasonal flu causes more than 20,000 deaths per year, and that number of deaths increases dramatically during years of flu pandemics. Now, since the annual pandemic risk is considerable, we think about this issue as a, as a problem of major global and public health significance. Now, interestingly, the highest rates, the rates of death in flu-infected patients occur in those who develop secondary pneumonias by staph aureus, but it's unclear as to why that's the case. So we asked the question, well, how does flu promote secondary staph infections in alveoli, which are the gas exchange units of the lung, that lead to alveolar damage and respiratory failure? And since that question is kind of complex, we started with something simpler, which was how do inhaled staph initiate infection in alveoli of healthy lung? So to answer this question, we uh, began by preparing a uh, staph strain, USA 300, that's a clinically virulent strain. We intranasally instilled them into mice, and then we perform a surgery whereby we place three cannulas, one in the trachea, one in the pulmonary artery, and one in the left atrium. We then remove the heart, lungs, and cannulas on block and arrange them at a confocal microscope objective. We attach the tracheal cannula to a ventilator and the PA and LA cannulas to a pump that we use to perfuse the lungs with blood. So when we're finished, what we have in front of us is a live, intact blood perfused lung that we can use to view single alveoli or groups of alveoli called passenite. We also instill the bacteria directly into lung alveoli by alveolar micropuncture. So you'll recall that my first question was, how do inhaled staph stabilize in lung alveoli? And let me show you uh, what we found. So this is a confocal image of live alveoli one hour after intranasal installation of staph. So the red fluorescence is the alveolar epithelium, black is the air spaces, and the green is the staph bacteria. So you can see here a couple of things. First, inhaled staph, are, uh, they reach the alveoli and they're associated with the alveolar wall. But that association isn't random. We found that it was uh, the bacteria were localized in structural regions of the lung where three alveolar septa come together, like for example, right here. 
So we termed those structural regions niches of alveoli, and we called the clusters of bacteria there microaggregates. And in this high power image, I think you can get a sense of how big some of those microaggregates were. So for example, this single microaggregate incorporates at least 30 individual bacteria in this two dimensional image. So we did a number of uh, investigations to better understand the microaggregates, and we found a few things. First, that they form rapidly within minutes. Second, that they only form in niches of alveoli, not on flat surface of, uh, surfaces of alveoli and not in vitro. And third, that they form due to interactions between staph bacteria, and that relates to a staph protein uh, called PHNB. So the significance of these findings were that these microaggregates of staph were stabilized in these niches of alveoli for hours, and they induced uh, localized alveolar damage to the underlying alveolar epithelium. And those damage signals then spread widely from infected to uninfected alveoli, which dramatically uh, increased the uh, extent of the infection and led to widespread pulmonary edema and fatal lung infection. So an interesting aspect of this project was that we found that not all staph bacteria form stabilized microaggregates. So they form microaggregates, but those microaggregates may not be stable in the lung. And let me explain what I mean by that. So uh, this is another confocal image of live alveoli. Here I've digitally removed the red fluorescence in order to better show you the green fluorescence of the bacteria. So what you're looking at is microaggregates of uh, USA 300 bacteria that were instilled directly into the lung in exponential growth phase. So we tried to understand the stability of the microaggregates by attempting to dislodge them. So we microinstilled um, buffer directly into the alveolar air spaces. It was almost like a power wash to try to remove the bacteria. And you can see in this post-wash image that the fluorescence of the bacteria is the same. So our wash efforts made no impact and failed to dislodge the bacteria. But we found kind of by accident that although USA 300 in stationary growth phase still formed microaggregates and niches, they were much more susceptible to washout. So I think you can appreciate from the group findings here, which uh, quantify the, the imaging data, that whereas the exponential phase microaggregates were highly resistant to washout, the stationary phase bacteria were very susceptible. They were unstable in alveoli. Now we took interest in this phenomenon because when we think about how lung infections initiate, the thought is that staph bacteria are inhaled from the nasal epithelium into the lung. So it turns out that the inhaled bacteria are, are much more likely to be in the stationary growth phase than the exponential growth phase, which is like a very specific region or time period during bacterial growth. So we thought, well, if stationary growth phase bacteria are the bacteria inhaled into a flu-infected lung, but those bacteria don't stick, how do they initiate a lung infection? How, how is this possible? So we tried to answer that question by a three-step experiment. We first intranasally instilled mice with buffer or flu. The following day, we intranasally instilled them with staph. And then an hour later, we took out the lungs and imaged the staph and alveoli to see what happened. Were they retained in the alveolus or were they not? So these are uh, two confocal images of live uh, bacteria and live alveoli. Like the previous images you've seen, I've digitally removed that red fluorescence of the alveolar epithelium to better show you the green fluorescence of the bug. And, uh, but I've outlined a couple of examples of alveoli to give you a sense of size. And I think you can see here that the size and the distribution of the microaggregates is similar between the flu and the, back, and the buffer pretreated lungs. So this is the same uh, alveolar region of the buffer pretreated lungs. I did nothing except come back and re-image this two hours later. And I found that there was major loss of staph fluorescence, indicating that the bacteria were spontaneously cleared from lung alveoli. However, they were retained in alveoli of the flu-infected lung. And uh, the, this uh, bar diagram quantifies the imaging data to again show that whereas the uh, staph bacteria were spontaneously removed from live alveoli of healthy lungs, they were retained in alveoli of flu-infected lungs. And so flu caused alveolar retention of staph. And the first, our first suspicion was that maybe this retention was due to a failure of immune function in flu-infected uh, lungs. But we did a number of uh, investigations and I, that I don't have time to go through, um, but basically we found that that was not the case. So that pointed to the retention relating to some kind of um, endogenous alveolar mechanism of bacterial thing. So if that's the case, what was that mechanism? Um, this doesn't show up very well on this screen, but there is a blue uh, outline here that I've kind of exaggerated 
Um, and that represents a liquid layer that lines the alveolar surface of healthy alveoli. And the purpose of that liquid layer is uh, it, it underlies the surfactant layer. And that surfactant layer is what's uh, responsible for keeping our alveolar air spaces open, gas filled and not collapsed. So this uh, alveolar uh, wall liquid is secreted continuously by the alveolar epithelium and it's critically important to normal alveolar function. But it turns out it also has a defensive function. So that continuous secretion generates a flow of liquid along the alveolar surface, which then convectively transports inhaled particles out of alveoli and toward the small airways where they can then be subsequently removed from the lung. So we thought that this might be important in flu pathogenesis because we reason that you know, if secretion of this liquid clears particles from alveoli, maybe it also clears bacteria. And perhaps the retention of bacteria in the flu-infected lung might be due to a failure of the secretion of liquid. So we can identify uh, liquid secretion in live alveoli using our imaging method. And to do that, we, we instill uh, into alveolar airspaces a fluorescent wall liquid tracer. As the secretion happens, this tracer becomes progressively diluted and loses fluorescence. So to uh, restate it then, loss of time-dependent loss of tracer fluorescence and alveoli indicates dilution by alveolar wall liquid secretion. So that is the basis of the assay, and let me show you now what we found. Um, so this again is a confocal image of live alveoli. Uh, the red fluorescence is the alveolar wall, black is the air spaces, uh, but here the green is not bacteria. This is our wall liquid tracer in alveolar air spaces. This is the same image, but here I've digitally removed that red fluorescence of the alveolar epithelium. And you can see that in this movie, over time, <clears throat> that green fluorescence is gradually lost. And we interpret from that loss of trace of fluorescence that as expected, wall liquid secretion is present in this healthy lung. Um, this is a group of alveoli in a flu infected lung. And as different from the control situation, you can see that the fluorescence of the tracer is retained and in fact increases a little bit. And we interpret from the retention of tracer fluorescence that alveolar wall liquid secretion was absent and we conclude that flu lung infection block alveolar wall liquid secretion. So the next uh, question was how? So to get at mechanism, we repeated this tracer experiment under a number of different conditions. We intranasally instilled mice with either PBS or flu, and then we pretreated the alveolar epithelium with uh, drugs that activated or blocked uh, the CFTR protein. And the reason for targeting CFTR is that it's known that CFTR uh, that chloride flux through CFTR in the alveolar epithelium drives that continuous liquid secretion. So these are findings you've already seen, which is that in a healthy lung, there was loss of trace of fluorescence indicating alveolar wall liquid secretion was present. And as expected, when we blocked CFTR in alveolar epithelium, we blocked wall liquid secretion. So that was all as expected. And these are findings that you've also already seen, which is that the trace of fluorescence increased in alveoli of flu infected lungs, indicating that wall liquid secretion was absent and perhaps actually airspace liquid was absorbed. And we targeted the CFTR protein by activating it with forskolin or potentiating it with ibocaptor. And under both conditions, we found that we could restore alveolar wall liquid secretion. So that told us that flu blocked alveolar wall liquid secretion through inhibition of CFTR in the alveolar epithelium. And I don't have time to go into more uh, aspects of this project, but I will mention we were surprised by this airspace liquid absorption and that's also been an area of, uh, of ongoing investigation in our lab. So um, a few last things I want to point out is that we found that this loss of alveolar wall liquid secretion actually explained why the staph bacteria were retained in alveoli of flu infected lungs. We found that CFTR potentiator therapy then rescued that alveolar wall liquid secretion. And we found that um, rescuing alveolar wall liquid secretion was protective against fatal lung injury in mouse models of flu staph lung infection. And we, uh, the rescue was by systemic administration of ibocaptor, but also by use of a plasmid that genetically inhibited the way in which flu blocked CFTR, which was dephosphorylation. So if we blocked that dephosphorylation response, we could also restore well liquid secretion and increase survival. So I'll just summarize then with this cartoon of an alveolus. So the way that we're thinking about this is that in uh, under conditions of health, uh, normal function of the CFTR protein in alve alveolar epithelium drives secretion of wall liquid into the airspace. And that airspace uh, liquid is critical for normal alveolar function. Now, uh, in the presence of that wall liquid secretion and its associated flow, 
inhaled Staph aureus and their secreted toxins are cleared from alveoli and therefore don't cause infection or alve alveolar damage. But uh, in flu infected lungs, the situation is very different. Um, now flu uh, lung infection induces dephosphorylation of CFTR, which blocks its function. That actually induces um, uptake of sodium by the, epithelial, by the epithelial sodium channel, which ultimately drives net absorption of liquid from the alveolar airspace. And the, uh, this absorptive microenvironment now leads to a situation in which inhaled staph and their secreted toxins are retained against the alveolar wall, inducing alveolar damage, initiating lung infection, and causing prolonged and fatal uh, lung infection. And then finally, targeting CFTR, um, but with AWL rescue approaches, are able to protect against fatal lung injury and through cyclical infection. So um, before I wrap up, then I just want to mention, I think, you know, the way that we're thinking about kind of the significance of these findings is that um, I think it changes the way that we, uh, at least in the lung biology community, think about liquid and lung alveoli. Because normally we think of alveolar, you know, airspace liquid as being bad, because what we're thinking about is pulmonary edema fluid. Um, and of course, that's, you know, that's not good. Lung can't function if it's filled with pulmonary edema fluid. But I think what our findings add to this discussion is the new recognition that, in fact, loss of liquid in the alveolar airspace is also bad because that liquid is necessary for normal function and for normal defense. So now here we have a situation where a respiratory virus is blocking that secretion mechanism, thereby exposing alveoli to a secondary infection by staph. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who's helped me, um, including Cap, who's in, in the audience and will give a talk later today and who gave us an opportunity to get started um, here at Mount Sinai. And I will mention also we are working on setting up uh, a human lung imaging program, which I've done. I've done human lung imaging. I set that up during um, my postdoc at a different institution. Now that we have the new lung transplant program, we're setting that up here. Um, and we're pretty close to that, actually. So hopefully we'll be able to get that started real soon. Thanks again. This was what led to this discussion with IP, yeah. Well, so, I mean, from a clinical point of view, it seems like low hanging fruit. You know, you could select, for example, um, patients admitted to the hospital with flu who you know are at risk for a secondary staph infection. Their mortality, people who get a secondary staph infection have mortality rates of, you know, 20 to 50 percent. Um, so, you know, if you target people who come into the hospital with flu infections, almost all of them will get um, Tamiflu. So at the same time, if they were to get, for example, a five-day course of Ivacaptor, and then you could quantify, you know, uh, uh, incidence of secondary staph infections or any bacterial infection, because I suspect this is a conserved mechanism, probably not just for staph, probably not just for flu. So, you know, I think it's a, a neat opportunity to really develop a new host directive therapy for lung infection that gets around some of these issues of antibiotic resistance, et cetera. Um, but I learned recently. Uh, I've kind of gotten to know the or made some inroads into the CF community. And I, I learned that there's, you know, potentially an unexpected barrier to translating this uh, to clinical practice, which is that um, at least in the CF community, I don't know if this uh, extends to other fields, um, but I, I get the sense that pharma companies, uh, especially companies like Vertex, which own uh, Ivacaptor, are um, a little bit reluctant to expand their Ivacaptor use to other populations because if unexpected things happen, like for example, um, people have an adverse event. And you know, the flu population is a messy population. It's not like CF where you have a well-defined group of prim primarily young people. So now if you expand it, now you have a bunch of older people or people with comorbidities who may have adverse events. And then all of a sudden, if they start having adverse events, then perhaps that would negatively impact the availability of a cap of Ivacaptor for other you know, people with CF indications. I don't know if that's pushed by Vertex or more by the CF community, who I think is very protective, uh, as would be expected of this kind of drug and its availability. Um, but that may be a barrier uh, that, that we might have to figure out a way around. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't. The more you learn, the more you learn, I guess, you know. 
I think so. And I had talked with uh, our IP people about, you know, the, my, my understanding from talking with Peter Palazzi was that kind of the first step is to see if we can get a use patent for a new indication for Ibocaptor. So Ibocaptor and flu. That's actually, there's no patent, even though the list of Ibocaptor patents is like miles long, it actually doesn't cover flu. And so there's an opportunity there, but the IP, the IP people, maybe we can talk about it a little later, but they wanted to see some human data, which is difficult when you're talking about a drug in people who, uh, who, who don't meet the indications. You know, like you can't say, oh, I'm gonna give Ivacaptor to, to a person then show you that the, the data are what, they, what we would expect. But there is data, I think, that Ivacaptor reduces severity of flu infections in CF populations. So maybe something like that would be enough to kind of get us started. I mean, when I first, uh, when I first saw this, I, I thought, well, Ivacaptor is tremendously expensive. So let's say that you now broaden the, the indications and you've increased to people who are hospitalized with the flu. That's like hundreds of thousands of people over a five to 10 year period. You know, there is something like 30,000 people are hospitalized every year with the flu at least. And so, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. A five day course for you know, a chunk of these people could be a huge source of revenue, I would think. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And I first heard that from a CF doctor who said, ooh, you know, this could maybe decrease the cost for CF patients. So, but it would be nice to have some partners, you know, in, in Mount Sinai that we could kind of uh, explore this with, because I have a captor, it's already clinically proven and it's safe. Yeah, it's a thoughtful question. Thank you. Um, and I think you have a talk later on CFTR, right? So that's fabulous. Yeah, I'd love to talk more. Um, great opportunity for collaboration. So I, I think your question is an important one because actually CFTR, as you know, is primarily thought of as an array of protein. Um, the way that we've quantified staff so far has been in a coarse manner um, by just quantifying whole lung uh, counts of viable staff. And what I can say is that, you know, we even though we saw a disappearance of staph fluorescence from alveoli, we did not see a reduction in numbers of viable bac bac bacteria in the whole lung. So that's why we're, we think that the bacteria transported out from the alveolus and into the airspace. So the total number of staph in the lungs is probably the same, but whereas in the alveoli, it causes lung injury in the airspace less so, or in the, yeah, in the airways less so. So um, it, I think it's an important follow-up question also, like do we see you know, it's it's known actually in airway epithelium in vitro that flu also blocks CFTR function, but it's by ubiquitination protein loss mechanism, whereas we found defosphorylation. Lots of opportunities, I think, for follow up. Thanks for all the questions. Talk was in presentation mode, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Here we go. Came from a Mac originally. All right, well, I'll, I'll get started. Worst case scenario, I'll just keep it in this. So my name is Amir Horowitz. Um, I am an assistant professor uh, in oncological sciences at the Precision Immunology Institute here and at Tisch Cancer Institute. Um, I'm going to be presenting on a very specific 
project as an overview, but I just want to sort of make the general statement. I'm grateful to Eric, to a number of you that I'm already getting to collaborate with. I'm grateful to the organizers as well for the invitation. So um, today I'm going to discuss in part a new technology called imaging mass cytometry, and I'm going to sort of shape it in the context of tonsil-based uh, science and a focus on a subset of immune cells called natural killer cells. Um, so the overarching questions really sort of for my lab about this project is about the development of these cells. Um, NK cells are emerging in cancer immunotherapies as well as many other clinical settings, and the field of study is exploding, yet as soon as we get outside of the peripheral blood, we really don't know what we're looking at. And so um, I took the, the responsibility, I guess, of developing an antibody panel that would allow us to profile human NK cells in C2 with a much higher resolution than previously possible. So in this study, we're interested in the central roles of NK cells in human tonsils, which cells they interact with, um, really diving into these cell-cell interactions that are occurring during and sort of throughout their development, and trying to understand the spatial relationships in the con context of healthy versus inflamed uh, tonsil tissues. Um, ultimately, my goal is to focus on uh, head and neck cancer, how uh, cancer alters the tonsillar microenvironment uh, and ultimately perturbs the NK cell functions. Um, but as many of us studying head and neck cancer know, um, viral infections are, are a major component of this, uh, notwithstanding human papillomavirus. So where I study viral infections from the context of how they shape an antiviral response, HPV is quite curious in that it's actually shaping the transformation of this. So I'll, I'll dive towards the end as to what we're doing in that context. Um, but ultimately trying to understand, is there a way of tapping into the already established heterogeneity of NK cells in this tissue as a means of exploiting these cells for improving uh, more traditionally T-cell targeted immunotherapies. All right, so um, just a very brief background on what we know about NK cells. Uh, more than 99% of everything we know comes from studies of the peripheral blood. And as we start venturing into human tissues, uh, we appreciate that there's just as much heterogeneity in the human tissues as we show in the, in the peripheral blood. Um, and historical studies have done a really nice job a recapitulating development, but they always um, rely on very artificial in vitro models. So using a murine fetal stromal line, we can take human stem cells in a dish with the right uh, cocktail, if you will, of uh, cytokines, and we can turn a stem cell into an NK cell, and we can learn um, really volumes about these cells where we've sort of historically defined them across these stages of development. Um, the main take-home point on the slide is that you'll notice um, before certain stages of development, these cells lack certain specialized functions. So unlike a T cell or a B cell, the other major lymphocytes, um, NK cells lack true antigen-specific receptors. So the phenotype of a given cell closely reflects that cell's capacity to respond to its microenvironment. And given how heterogeneous this subset is, it would behoove us to understand truly what we're looking at when we're trying to position ourselves to understand the protective and or pathogenic roles that these cells are playing and how we can uh, tickle them the right way to make them do what we want. So as a means of trying to really understand how these cells look in C2 um, and how they sort of organize in this process, we undertook uh, the first ever in C2 panel based on 40 antibodies simultaneously. Um, unique to this technology, antibodies are conjugated to rare earth metals. So um, we choose metals from the lanthanide series of the periodic table. There's no overlap with human biology. And ultimately, the data are acquired through mass spec. So where uh, traditional immunofluorescence relies on uh, fluorescence amplification. Immunohistochemistry relies on enzymatic amplification. You don't have the ability of combining so many uh, overlapping and discrete signals in order to do these sort of combinatorial analyses. And so um, at a high level, you're able to stain tissue. This is really designed 
um, in the spirit of FFP tissue, although it absolutely works on frozen. Um, and through using a UV laser to actually sort of disrupt the tissue, um, it releases these metals that are conjugate to very specific antibodies, which we already know of. And then you can essentially uh, reconstruct, if you will, pixel by pixel an image. And then what we do is we essentially can get very, very high resolution uh, imaging. Apologies, the scale bar doesn't show up here, but um, you know, essentially what you're looking at are representative uh, B cell follicles, uh, stroma nicely mapped out there. Um, just to show you uh, very briefly what goes into this, um, we have different stages of the pre-processing analysis. We need to go through a process called cell segmentation. This defines the area of the nucleus, as well as uh, defining the plasma membrane so that we can uh, do subtractive analyses uh, to look at things that are expressed on the cell surface or inside uh, the cell. We can create what's called the cell mask. Um, at the moment where the field is at, this is not perfect. So we're still kind of early stages of development, but uh, what we can do once we have these cell masks is that we can define any one subset of cells based on any one up to 40 antibodies, call it a complex phenotype, assign a pseudo color to that phenotype, and now map it back onto the original image where we can start doing true spatial relationship uh, based analysis. So um, just um, a very brief overview of the study, just to have really data to, to highlight for you. This was a study looking at pediatric um, uh, patients where we essentially divided a cohort of about 20 kids between healthy uninflamed versus acute focal tonsillitis. The idea was the super basic question of inflammation and how is that going to modulate the microenvironment. And so this is just showing a simple clustering analysis based on the data from about 160 um, ablated regions of interest from these 20 kids, um, showing that we can, um, with our antibody panel, identify various subsets of immune cells, stromal cells, uh, including really a very highly resolved breakdown within the repertoire of NK cells. The NK cells, as you can see based on these colors, um, they seem to sort of aggregate in this n-dimensional space uh, together, which is kind of nice to see as an internal control. Um, and sorry. So you can see here as well, when we repeat this, when filtered down to the NK cells, um, we can get a lot uh, sort of better segregation of these clusters. Now, one of the, the mainstay uh, analyses for this type of work is to really um, address from the lens of any one type of cell, what are all the other types of cells that it's interacting with? What's the frequency of interactions? Are there biases suggesting one interaction is like infinitely greater likelihood than another or certain interactions that simply never happen? And we can deduce from that meaning depending on sort of what the microenvironment is that we're looking at. In this case, it's just acute inflammation and what does that do? So it's a series of pairwise comparisons asking the frequency of observed versus expected interactions. And if we use NK cells here as sort of the driving um, force of this analysis, um, what we see is that in uninflamed tissues, the greatest interactions NK cells are making, interestingly, are with other NK cells. But next to that are with B cells and some of the epithelial cells some myeloid cells. Um, interestingly, in acute inflammation, this picture changes quite dramatically. There's a big shift to focusing their interactions with various subsets of T cells and stroma. And so I'll show you a little bit as to what we believe is going on here. So we can take a look at these complex phenotypes. Um, some of these NK cell subsets are defined um, by as many as 17 different receptors. Um, and so here's just sort of overall NK cells in turquoise um, showing back onto the uh, original image, showing how they interact, how they're spatially organized in an uninflamed setting, and how you can see them changing sort of where they're most abundant in inflamed settings. And just to make um, one sort of point here, 
there's never been any evidence ever shown in human uh, tissues that NK cells can enter into a B cell follicle. So just by having so many antibodies and analyzing it this way, we've already uncovered um, a new foundational truth about this in that this positions these cells interacting with follicular helper CD4 T cells, myeloid DCs in this subset, as well as B cells. And we don't have the resolution in this study to really dive into the architecture of the B cells and T cells. Um, but if we extrapolate based on sort of what we could do collaboratively in the setting, um, it, it's a very exciting time to be doing this. So we can break down this tissue according to the microarchitecture, uh, specifically into regions of subepithelial, follicle, or inter and parafollicular. Um, and we can map back these individual stages of NK cell developmental intermediates um, to see really what are the major regions that they're hanging out. So shown as an example here are looking at mature cytolytically competent um, NK cells, referred to as stage 4B, showing that they can be found uh, really in a number of these different locations. It seems as you mature as an NK cell, your privileges of traversing the various areas of these tissues is increased. You have more latitude, uh, which also carries with it the understanding that it could contribute to better anti-tumor functions, but also potentially be involved in pathogenic roles as well. Um, so speaking to the work that Paolo was showing earlier with the GOMX, the GOMX uh, spatial transcriptomics, we actually did that in this study as well. I won't take you through all the data, but just to say this was done on consecutive sections. So the idea here is whether you do one versus the other, first versus second, I think the holy grail of where we want to take this is that you have a sense of, of your microenvironment. You do sequencing to get a really granular view, and then you have a panel of 40 antibodies that let's say 30 of them are defined a priori based on you know, your expertise and you leave set number of channels open to learn from the spatial sequencing data. And then you can go back to the uh, imaging and uh, validate at that level. And so this is just showing you an example here. I'm not showing you this, the spatial seq data. I'm showing you sort of the information we gleaned from it. Um, what we found specific to inflammation um, through the spatial sequencing was that within these B cell follicles, sort of hugging these boundaries with the stroma, we saw um, a high increase in chemokines that actually associate with the chemokine receptors that were expressed on these NK cells. It's just to highlight an example for you that we're able to make these touch points connecting these two uh, different types of data. Um, this is the final set of slides I'm going to show you. Um, we took this one step further into sort of super resolution microscopy. It's a really important point to appreciate the limitations of imaging mass cytometry. What you're getting with so many antibodies simultaneously, you're getting pixel resolution at one to 10 microns. So, I mean, it's fantastic. It's not as good as uh, what you need for really studying cellular uh, interactions. Um, what we're showing here, though, is on consecutive sections. And what we found is that IL-15 is playing a central critical role here, um, where these NK cells are interacting with IL-15 positive cells. And this increases, as one would expect, in settings of acute inflammation. Uh, if we were to zoom in here, what we can see here um, are really these sort of polarizations by what could be immune synapses really showing uh, the degree of uh, communication that these cells are making. So shown here is just a merged image looking at expression of IL-15, uh, the IL-15 receptor, CD122, and CD56 is a you know, very gross level lineage marker for NK cells. And you can see really nicely here examples of cells that are lit up for IL-15 as well as the IL-15 receptor. Um, really kind of getting us into this sort of my final slide here is schematic model. Um, when you compare NK cells, um, again, for the first time ever, we're showing evidence that they're entering parts of this uh, microenvironment that we never really expected to see them. And so uh, this um, broadens the questions that we can and should be asking um, in this setting. But um, really what this allows us to do is combine this 
with other uh, modalities that we're studying so that we can um, really do sort of more collective uh, questions. So this, for example, is a study that came out of Mount Sinai Department of uh, Otolaryngology, the Sears trial, um, where this is based on 55 patients. The study um, has, has already been done, and we're sitting on a gorgeous biorepository of matched tissue spe specimens, both from the tumor tissue and the contralateral tonsil, where we also have blood on these patients longitudinally. So just to sort of give you a glimpse of the types of studies that we're doing here, um, we're able to do um, RNA level uh, analyses, DNA level analyses, and protein level analyses while maintaining um, the ability of studying these interactions in C2. Um, what we're in the process of doing more broadly is trying to um, curate what we have currently uh, for retrospective uh, studies here at Mount Sinai. So with the work of uh, two really brilliant postdocs in Nina Bardwaj's lab uh, helping me out, we went through sort of all the uh, medical records here at Mount Sinai, and we found um, that in order to get a healthy collection of matched tissues to really start diving in, um, we have about 250 patients with HPV and about 160 patients without HPV that we could really use that as sort of the higher level stratifying. Um, so uh, with that, um, it's really, it's, it's quite a large group of people that have been coming together around uh, airway sciences here at Mount Sinai with me, which I'm delighted about. Um, studies I didn't get to discuss, our work with uh, Eric and Benny Laitman focused on uh, tracheal transplantation and some of this imaging, as well as um, studies of inflammation and vocal folds. So happy to take any questions. Um, it will never work well unless it's a prospective study. That's the short answer. I can tell you the work I'm doing in kidney with this, um, we're taking sort of, you know, it's a, a cre anything you do differently right now can just be considered creative. We don't know if it's going to be better than what's tried to date, but we're actually using um, silk sutures in the surgery to take different regions of the kidney relative to each other so that just going into the imaging, we know it from there. And then it's a matter of what we call tiling. So these are, these are really small regions of interest that we're talking about. It's like one, one millimeter by one millimeter, and it's very expensive cost prohibitive technology still. Um, this study being the first to market, we were able to literally like tile the entire section of tonsil. To your question though, we didn't have the resolution and understanding of where the tissues were coming from in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I'm actually a pretty junior fish in the pond. Um, for my field, I, I'm able to get these conversations going, but you can imagine a piece of tissue in a paraffin block. There's only so many sections you can get out of that before depleting it. It's a political game right now at these uh, repositories that you're talking about. They're focusing on harmonization questions. Can we look at the same panel on the same block on different instruments at different institutions? It's one of these things. I think we need to focus that question on perspective. So. All right, well, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. This is my channel. Can everyone hear me? I hope. Um, I'm Monica Kraft, great to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, 
Um, I'm at a, another lung conference in Colorado at the moment, but I'm very excited to be with you. And this has been a great session. I'm really uh, uh, looking forward to getting to know everyone. Um, and so I wanted to, I'm just so glad I have the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about some work that we're doing. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I can't really tell, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go with it. Maybe someone can uh, just text me if there's any type of, uh, um, uh, you know, any, any type of technical issue. So I, I'm getting to know all of you, and these are just some of my research interests so that you are aware. And uh, certainly mechanisms of inflammation and aid immunity, the microbiome and asthma, um, type two inflammation and SARS-CoV-2, biomarkers, genetics, genomics, um, precision medicine and clinical trials. And so today I'm gonna to just talk about a little piece of what we do in the innate immunity arena. And this is really talking about surfactant uh, proteins. Now, when you think about surfactant, you might be thinking about, of course, what babies receive who are in respiratory distress. And that's really gonna be focused more on the surfactant proteins B, C, and the lipid component to reduce surface tension. Well, surfactant is also known to have a lot of host defense properties, and that's really carried out by surfactant proteins A and D. But today I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about and convince you that there's a link between SPA and inflammatory lung disease, in this case, asthma. So surfactant protein A is a very large protein. It's an octadecamer, and it's composed of trimers that come from monomers. And of course, each of these monomers have domains relevant to function. The collagen domain, for instance, is, is, uh, is responsible for oligomerization receptor binding. We've become very interested in this lectin domain, which is responsible for carbohydrate, pathogen, and lipid recognition. So more to come on that. Our very high level hypothesis is that you need an adequate pool of functional SPA for normal lung function. And in the case where it might be low or dysfunctional, that then promotes the presentation of asthma. And we've had previous publications that I won't talk about today that some individuals, especially those who have asthma who are obese, have low levels of SPA in their lung, whereas others have normal levels, but it's dysfunctional. So in order to really investigate this, many years ago when I was at National Jewish and then at Duke, there've been some very interesting links between animal models of asthma and SPA. And so we can study, uh, um, there's different ways of looking at uh, animal uh, asthma studies in mice using an IL-13 exposure model, which I'll show you today, ovalbumin, which has been around a very long time, and house dust mite, which is probably the more recent, more commonly used model of, of uh, to recapitulate asthma in a mouse. Um, we have an, an SPA deficient mouse model. And so back really, really building on work that we started at National Jewish and Duke showed that if you expose an SPA deficient mouse to interleukin 13, which is an important type two cytokine in asthma, really in the eosinophilic asthma phenotype that composes about 60% of the asthma we see, you can appreciate that these mice have increased total cells in their lavage. They tend to be eosinophils and neutrophils. And they also have increased uh, MUC5 message and mucin, that's this PAS score, and also have enhanced KC, which is the equivalent of IL-8, eotaxin, and IL-6. So a very exuberant response to IL-13 when SPA is not present. Drilling down a little bit more on some of the, uh, the on the mucin piece, you can see that even wild type mice when exposed to IL-13 have increased uh, um, mucin, and that's all the, the pink staining that you see. But in that SPA deficient mouse, it's even uh, exaggerated. And we see this whether we expose these mice to IL-13 or OVA. In addition, exogenous SPA can actually reduce mucin production and lavage eosinophilia in allergic mouse models. So it can rescue an SPA deficient mouse. And this is a house dust mice, house dust mite model, where in fact, um, SPA rescue reduced mucin, that's this PAS score, as well as total eosinophils in BAL. So switching over to the human condition, I think there's so many incredible ways to look at the airway epithelial cells in humans now. We have these tools available to us that really allow us to identify some very unique cell populations that are coming out at ATS. We had a lot of conversations about the tough cell. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's really a lot of movement in this arena. And I've been involved in bronchoscopy-based research for many years to really be able to really look at primary airway epithelial cells and other cells from patients with uh, 
uh, well phenotype patients with asthma. And we do this via, you know, with bronchoscopy. And, and I'm planning to bring this to Mount Sinai. I'm very excited about that with the CAPS uh, help. And uh, in fact, you can certainly obtain proximal airway epithelial cells that way. Certainly you can get to the nasal epithelium very easily through brushing. And then we're doing some studies now uh, with bronchoscopy under, with fluoro guidance to try to get at the distal airway epithelial cell and have those as primary. Because the, the good news is with expansion techniques as they exist, you can really expand the cells that you get. We uh, tried this a few years ago at Duke. We're not as successful, but lately we've been doing it in Arizona and really been able to expand the population of both proximal and distal airway epithelial cells. And they're quite different in how they handle insults, their response to, to allergens, IL-13, but also to infectious agents because we're also investigating uh, SARS-CoV-2. So back to the SPA story. So this is some work we published in JI a couple of years ago. It shows that um, SPA attenuates IL-13 uh, induced inflammation in human airway epithelial cells. So these are proximal airway epithelial cells cultured in air liquid interface. In this setting, we looked at both IL-8 and uh, MUC5 uh, AC message. And you can see that um, certainly there are some differences, uh, particularly in IL-8 between asthma and normal, not as much uh, in MUC5, but SPA attenuates both IL-8 and, uh, and MUC-5. So when we, tried, when we drilled down to try to understand how this works, we found a, an, a, an, interesting, um, uh, uh, an interesting finding in that it looks like SPA inhibits IL-13-induced phosphorylation of STAT-3, but not STAT-6. So if you're familiar with, with uh, the inflammatory cascades, STAT-3 and 6 are really important in the inflammation we see in type 2 asthma, especially around mucin and other mediators. Um, and what's interesting about this, this is our, these are from primary cells from patients with and without asthma. You can see when you expose them to uh, IL-13, you see STAT-3 phosphorylation. Um, when you add SPA, it's, uh, it, it decreases. We don't see much STAT-3 at all in normals. However, STAT-6, we're not seeing much effective SPA at all. We were pretty surprised by this, uh, this difference because we had assumed that if SPA is binding to the IL-13 receptor, that we ought to see both. But that may not be what's happening. And so we went back to our mouse and found it, in, in fact, if you inhibit STAT3 in an SPA deficient mouse, again, you see less uh, total cells in BAL and less mucin. So we try to go back and forth between mouse and man and try to uh, really um, validate some of our findings in both models, if you will. So when trying to understand this differential between SAT3 and 6, we found this interesting paper that suggests that, um, that uh, IL-6, which is also uh, increased with IL-13 uh, exposure, may in fact um, uh, uh, you know, attach to or, or, or convene with its receptor GP130 and also lead to an association with uh, EGFR to in fact um, lead to EGFR dependent rephosphorylation of STAT3. And so perhaps that's a mechanism that's going on with regard to uh, our, our, our model. So when we looked at uh, IL-6 in our SPA deficient mouse following IL-13 exposure, it is indeed elevated. And when you inhibit IL-6 in the same model of SPA deficiency, you see a reduction of MUC5 and eataxin, um, very similar to what you would see with um, SPA rescue. And back to humans, if you in fact inhibit the IL-6 receptor, you can see it reduces IL-13-induced STAT3 activation similar to SPA. So certainly IL-6 is a, is, a, is a factor that we think is really important in how um, uh, SPA affects both STAT-3, IL-6, and ultimately reducing inflammation, especially at the level of mucin and eosinophils. And in humans, we found that inhibiting IL-6 signaling attenuates MUC5 AC expression and IL-13 stimulated bronchial epithelial cells. So just sort of going back and forth between mouse and man to make sure these observations we see are in fact true. So the next question we asked is, does genetic variation of SPA lead to dysfunction? Because we are seeing some evidence of dysfunction of SPA in patients with asthma and, and didn't quite understand why. So we sequenced the SPA1 and 2 peptides so this is another cartoon of the different domains of the monomer. And in fact, we found this very interesting polymorphism at position 223 of SPA2. And it's a substitution leading to a substitution of a glutamine for a lysine. And when we looked at our patients, those patients who carried the major allele, which was the glutamine, versus those with lysine had better lung function and better asthma control. So if you had this minor allele, 
which was present in about 30% of our patients, whether it's heterozygote or homozygote, you had lower lung function and worse asthma control. So in fact, that part of the SPA2 peptide seemed to really be a, a driver of some perhaps of these asthma phenotypes. So we, we hypothesized that position 223 and SPA2 seems to confer activity in either reducing phenotypes associated, associated with asthma or actually enhancing them depending on what allele was present. And so could we design small peptides that flank this particular area, region of the carbohydrate recognition domain and actually think about it as a therapeutic? And that's where the company was born, Recito. And with my dear friend and colleague, Julie Ledford, we co-founded this uh, company. You're probably wondering where this name came from. Uh, Ray is from Joe Ray Wright, who was Dean of the Graduate School at Duke, also a former ATS president, and had done a lot of great work in surfactant. And really we call her our spiritual leader. Unfortunately, she left us at too, too soon at age 56 um, due to breast cancer. So we're hoping she's uh, watching over us and happy with our, our progress. Uh, Cito is Latin for calming. And so therefore our company Reseda was born and we don't think anyone's gonna ever want that name. We won't have to worry about copyright issues. And so when we, we designed these uh, particular peptides that are 10 to 20 amino acids in length and uh, use them in our animal models, in this case, a house dust might challenge SPA deficient mouse um, treated with these peptides, in fact, had less eosinophils, fewer eosinophils in BAL and reduced mucin, similar to what we were seeing with the full length protein. What we're really excited about is we can actually show that these peptides reduce airways hyperresponsiveness, which is a typical way of looking at drug development in asthma. This is one of those characteristics. And so when we gave the peptide after each HDM challenge, which you can see down here is methacholine, of course, which is a bronchoconstrictor. You can see an increase in airways resistance, um, certainly uh, with, uh, with methacholine. And when the peptide was given, you see a nice reduction in airway hyperresponsiveness. So going back to our human models, in fact, the peptides reduce MUC5AC in normal and asthmatic airway epithelial cells, um, uh, significantly different than vehicle. So why is SPA replacement novel? Well, some work I didn't show you today uh, demonstrates that it is dysfunctional in asthma, not all asthma, but some. Um, it modulates type 2 inflammation, the most common asthma phenotype. Uh, the efficacy of the peptide, at least with regard to readouts who are particularly interested in asthma, such as you know, eosinophilic inflammation and mucin, um, seem to be as efficacious as those of the full-length protein. We're working on delivering it via the inhaled route because it's these small amino acid, uh, uh, these, small, these small 10 mer and 20 mers you can actually put into an inhaler. And so we're working with Loveless Institute in, in New Mexico uh, as part of a small business grant to move that forward. Um, because it's an endogenous protein, uh, we haven't seen a lot of toxicity, but of course need to do the formal tox studies in uh, two different uh, species of animals. And we think that this may benefit asthmatic patients who are obese, as we have shown a deficiency of SPA in this phenotype. So I'll stop there. I want to thank my lab. This is from a trip when I brought them out to New York. I'm, I've got several of them on, uh, signed on to join me, and there's a couple that are still deciding, so fingers crossed on that. And this is my son here who just finished his junior year at uh, NYU. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Monica. Can you can you hear us or no? I can. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, good. Perfect. Any any questions? Um, it's probably through this microphone that she can hear. If anybody has questions, you want to come up and ask her? Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Kraft, you can probably hear me, yeah? Yeah, I can. Hi, Jamie. Okay, great. Um, so this is Jamie Hook from the Pulmonary Division. And um, I just wanted to say thanks for, for joining us from Colorado. And um, this is really a fantastic body of work that's really quite inspiring, you know, to a young person like me. Um, and I was intrigued by, you know, this idea that uh, surfactant deficiency underlies at least part of the pathogenesis of asthma. And, you know, my understanding of you know, the surface uh, liquid layer in the airways is that uh, it's, it's not fully clear exactly where that liquid comes from. You know, when we think about the fact that the alveolar epithelium is 95% of the lung surface and the airways, you know, the subsequent 5% and thinking that uh, alveolar epithelial type two cells are, um, you know, the primary source of surfactants in the alveolus. 
do, have you um, identified where the upstream uh, deficiency comes from? You know, do you it, it, do you think that it's that it's from you know a deficiency in you know surfactant secretion or production by club cells or you know another cell in the airway? Or right. is it possible that asthma is an alveolar disease? Perhaps that sounds a little strange. No, uh, no, it doesn't. It's funny that you mentioned that. So I've been interested in the distal lung for for a long time. And we've actually shown that inflammation exists, not necessarily in the alveolar space, but certainly in the bronchioles. And we've done transbronchial biopsies and shown that gosh, uh, back in the 90s, we uh, published that. However, you know, SPA is interesting. And the surfactants, of course, type two cells are the major producers, club cells, as you mentioned. There's also some evidence that might be in the upper airway as well. And it certainly is present in the gut. And so we think in the setting of obesity, that we think that might be more of a stretch physical phenomenon because of course the chest wall mass and the compression of the, um, the, especially the distal lung in particular alters production. And we had started a project, which I would love to sort of resurrect where we had a model of stretch and we could stretch airway epithelial cells. And now that we're getting these distal cells through bronchoscopy, we can actually take a look at that. And in fact, it did, it did affect function very significantly. So that's something we haven't really interrogated thoroughly, but would love to do so. Um, but I think the, um, the rest, the other aspects of, of deficiency or dysfunction are really mostly probably from the club cells, um, we think. And, uh, and certainly one of the interesting aspects is IL-13 uh, exposure, which is, of course happens in type two asthma, can reduce the club cell population over time. And in fact, is that a reason why maybe there's either SPA deficiency or SPA dysfunction? Those are some questions that we have that um, I would love to uh, explore further. Thank you. That's, that's sure. Great. It's great to see you. Yeah, you too. You too. Monica, thank you very much. We're going to, um, we, we really appreciate it. Look forward to having you with us soon. Absolutely. We're on our way east. So see you very soon. Thank you. All right. Terrific. Good. So we'll take a uh, brief break and then uh, we'll come back. Did you want to take a picture? What in here out there? Out there. We'll do a quick picture outside and we'll come back and uh, finish up with four uh, quick talks. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I can. I will. I don't need to connect it, but I can click through my notes. That's sounds. what we were saying, but we weren't sure if people had their laptops I have mine. with them. I, I have a lot of backups, but I'd uh, like to. Did you already get to? I did. I know? did. So it should be, I think, that one. So what we want to do is let's extend. View. It should be okay. So if you just do from beginning, oh, see it's reversed. So they had present my notes up there. I think I would have to actually um, do it for a moment and then. Yeah, that's can... fine. Everyone's rushed watching. So. The way this is set up. Hello. All right, so it works. It works for now, but the problem is so people will be like going through it. Yeah. And then maybe if they're clicking too fast, it's late. That's what I, I think is okay. part of it. So worst case scenario, I I just slide through, but I just wanna I yeah. would be better to have this. I'll have my Yeah. Um so if you actually Oh okay, okay. If the worst case scenario, but 
Right, and then he just the meeting I can we can probably just share from his mind. He wouldn't even share, he just would have his own. Oh, okay, okay. I would just put it up there if I needed it. Yeah, right. you know, you could just share from his mind. Right. That, that, yeah, zoom on there. Yeah, I just it'll it'll be a whole problem, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, sure. Right. This will be great. Yeah, it's, no I think there. I think this if we leave it here, maybe it's time to load everything yeah. or something like that. You'll understand that this is what we need to do, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Take your time yeah, when you're yeah, progressing. Those during the break and I'm not gonna those... be rapid like yeah. pressing. Like if it doesn't work for one press, give it a second and okay. then and if it through. freezes, do I just click out? If it freezes, what it's gonna do is ask you to close the program or wait for it to respond. I would just close the program. Um, and just reopen it and, do, and reopen it and probably what you're going to have to do like out of presenter view and just and like just do it it's fine yeah okay but if that happens i'll have i'll keep an eye on it i'll probably have to just walk okay. up okay saw his PowerPoint here, but I couldn't see it up there until he went into like the PowerPoint, like actually start the top the PowerPoint show. It wouldn't even show up. It was crazy. I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the hell. Um, they set up before I got here. Yeah, I don't Um, oh. 
afternoon. Uh, my name is Benny Leitman, and I'm a resident ENT. And I mean, this has been an incre incredible uh, morning listening to some fascinating researchers. And I'm really grateful uh, to, to be here and have the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the work um, our group has been starting to do uh, examining uh, tracheal transplantation and mapping the human airway. So the talk is going to kind of give some broad overview of some of the work we're undertaking right now. So our work is really centered around an overarching interest in how we can improve healing outcomes in the upper airway. How can we repair, regenerate, or even prevent scarring? In the airway, the answers to these questions are critical. When scarring occurs in the trachea or the larynx, it can result in catastrophic narrowing that is life-threatening. People can't breathe. Extensive defects can leave some patients with permanent tracheostomies, and some are not even compatible with life. In the vocal folds, you can have Scarring can lead to some benign issues of dysphonia or swallowing, but also can uh, create some really uh, traumatic uh, airway uh, catastrophes. Iatrogenic injury, trauma, cancers can lead to fistulization between the trachea and the esophagus um, that are really difficult to manage. And, and in kids, problems can be congenital or they can require and require repair, but kids are also really more susceptible to uh, intubation injury or various uh, insults to the airway that leads to tracheal narrowing and long-term stenosis that leads to multiple recons and often will need, per uh, could need permanent tracheostomies. So accordingly, our group's work is divided into two major aims. One is on the heels of, of Dr. Jennings and his team's major accomplishment in, in uh, 2021 of the tracheal transplantation. We're diving into understanding the dynamics of human tracheal transplantation, importantly, looking at a concept of epithelial chimerism and how this may ultimately impact tracheal uh, transplant rejection. Uh, more broadly, we're also examining re-epithelialization dynamics in the airway to better understand how wound healing occurs and how we can improve upon it. So to start, I'm going to discuss a little bit of the work on tracheal transplantation and provide a background on what led, uh, led to the point we're at. So the airway can be severely damaged through a lot of different mechanisms. Iatrogenically, as a, re uh, as a result of intubation, trauma, burns, congenital issues, uh, malignancy or other diseases. And unfortunately, we're seeing a higher rates of some of the tracheal stenotic lesions in the wake of COVID due to long-term intubations with larger diameter endotracheal tubes. Reconstruction uh, for smaller airways, we can do cut, cutting out the stenotic lesions, balloon dilating, or even doing resection of the stenoses and, and doing primary anastomosis of the trachea. But the issue um, occurs with, with larger stage defects that can not undergo primary repair, and they leave patients with severe airway problems, uh, problems that sometimes will extend even to the chest, at which point they're incompatible with life. So there have been obviously attempts, thus because we have so many ways to, to damage the trachea, there have been attempts to replace damaged tracheas with various uh, materials over the years. Uh, there have been uh, historically uses of aortic homographs as a way to uh, create a, a lumen for the trachea, but they couldn't uh, withstand the inspiratory pressures that the trachea normally undergoes, showing us that you need a rigid structure for the trachea in order for it to be functional. Um, subsequently, people would use various stents to stent open stenotic lesions and stent open the airway, but these would extrude, migrate, or even uh, cause serious mucus plugging leading to death, showing that you needed biointegratable material within the trachea. So even, so, Further, they would use cadaveric tracheas uh, as a way to have a biointegratable material, but they lacked functional epithelium, and so these individuals would need further stenting it or would mucus plug over time. This last point, the importance of functional epithelium, really cannot be understated. I think we've kind of all talked about it in the, in the um, uh, presentations today. The small cilia that uh, on the uh, tracheal epithelium provide critical mucociliary clearance, without which we would mucus plug and suffocate. So given the need for a rigid construct that biologically integrates uh, with functional epithelium, Dr. Jenner and his team set out to determine if direct tracheal transplantation was a viable solution to this problem of large segment defects. So his, the early studies that were done were in mouse and in canine models. Uh, the mouse model of tracheal transplantation, a direct orthotopic transplant, um, really uh, is a great way to study tracheal integration and the impact of transplantation on the respiratory epithelium. Um, the tracheas can be transplanted from one mouse to another using microscopic suture techniques and the direct end-to-end -end anastomosis. Um, and in the present for allogeneic transplants, in the presence of immunosuppression, what you would ultimately see is a 
fully uh, functional trachea with a big lumen, but in the absence of immunosuppression in these transplants, the lumen would eventually obstruct due to inflammatory tissue and disruption of the epithelium. Uh, and this has actually also been a model, a model for other airway conditions like bronchiolitis obliterans. On a histologic level, uh, in H&E and EM, we see that in transplantation and syngeneic transplants, after initial sloughing of the, up, of the upper layers of epithelium, the trachea is repopulated with healthy, healthy ciliated mucosa. Uh, allografts, however, in the absence of immunosuppression, instead undergo, uh, undergo a degree of squamous metaplasia and never get that functional ciliated mucosa. This can be avoided in the presence of immunosuppression. What was really intriguing is that if immunosuppression is withdrawn after re-epithelialization, the trachea ends up not undergoing uh, rejection. And the reason for this may be that these transplants undergo progressive repopulation with the recipient-derived epithelium. Thus, over time, the tracheal allograft is sort of a chimera of both donor and recipient epithelium. And as the tracheal epithelium may be a prime target for immune rejection, replacement with recipient mucosa may in fact be an immunoprotective mechanism in these forms of transplantation. So after showing that transplants could be successful, large animal models were used to understand the critical vascular supply of the trachea, uh, which had precluded tracheal transplantation in the past. This ended up leaving, leading to the first uh, human stage, single stage tracheal transplantation uh, in early 2021 by Dr. Jenner and his team. Uh, the recipient was a middle-aged female, is a middle-aged female who had long tracheal segment disease, had undergone six prior primary attempts at reconstruction with that, with that ultimately failed. She had an extended length tracheostomy tube to bypass the stenotic lesions, but underwent frequent, uh, frequent mucus plugging with life-threatening airway events. And thus this was a life uh, saving uh, attempt for her. Uh, the disease was ultimately nine centimeters in length, which is uh, uh, much longer than any sort of primary uh, reconstruction was able to, to help with. The transplant's actually not just the trachea itself in the human. It's really interesting. In an effort to not disrupt the vascular supply, uh, the thyroid gland and actually a portion of demucosalized esophagus is taken with the trachea as well. This allows the anastomotic network that runs through these organs to, to supply the trachea to remain intact. And you can see a week out uh, on the left, um, narrow band, uh, via narrow band imaging, um, very well vascularized mucosa on the right. You can see a video here, an endoscopic view of the trachea with a healthy pink mucosa. One uh, week after, uh, on a histological level over time, we see that changes uh, recapitulate what was seen in prior animal models. Um, initially on about one week out, you see that sloughing of epithelium and squamous metaplasia. So you see that sloughing down to a basically a, a basal a cell layer. Uh, and lots of increased inflammation and submucosal va uh, vascularity that you see about two weeks out as well. Uh, you see an increase in squamous metaplasia about two weeks out, and the inflammation is pretty broad. You see an influx of T cells, B cells, increased amount of submucosal vascularity indicative of early stages of inflammation uh, after transplantation. However, as time goes on, what you see is the squamous metaplasia and inflammation is replaced with uh, progressively repopulating the trachea with functional ciliated epithelium and goblet cells. Um, a few weeks, and ultimately you see the um, cilia coming here um, and goblet cells de uh, that you can see here on HCD and EM with subsequent decreases in inflammatory infiltrate and submucosal vascularity and essentially ultimately almost no signs of inflammation over time. What's really fascinating is not only the epithelium regenerated, but much of the epithelium in the donor trachea over time became recipient in origin, just like in the animal models. Um, as the donor was an XY male and the recipient XX female, using fish cytogenetics, we could uh, track the chimerism ratios over time. So after an initial surge of recipient uh, epithelium coming in, there was a precipitous drop, but then it ended up level leveling off at a homeostatic level where you have tracheal mucosa that is in a chimer chimeric state. And this chimerism may be critical because we've not seen the levels of chronic and acute rejection that plagues other vascularized composite allograms. So what have we learned at this stage? We've learned that single stage uh, transplantation is indeed possible. The patient's alive, well, living without a tracheostomy. We've learned that the allograft undergoes re-epithelialization with recipient-derived epithelium. And we've, we've understood that standard immunosuppression is, is effective, but the chimerism that's occurring may be critical because in contrast to these other vascularized composite allografts, we're not seeing the high rates of acute rejection, high rates of chronic rejection thus far in our, in our uh, patient. 
but there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know what drives the re-epithelialization process. We don't actually know what cells are coming in, where they're coming from. We don't know if the epithelium is the sole target of the immune, uh, immune response and what the mechanism of uh, rejection and tracheal transplantation is. So we're going to be using, going back to the, some of these animal models and using fluorescent reporter mice to look at ways of tracking epithelial migration, uh, tracking what cells are coming in and where they're coming from. You can see a, a pilot study here where a keratin-14 mouse um, uh, had a red trachea essentially transplanted in. You can see keratin-14 cells, marker of basal cells in the uh, trachea migrating into the uh, recipient over time, uh, into the donated segment over time. We can use these models to look at reepithelialization with or without immunosuppression, as well as in the response of donor and recipient uh, derived immune cells. And further, we can use adoptive transfer experiments um, to look at the impact of the immune system on rejection, both in the presence of immunosuppression as well as in the presence of immunosuppressive withdrawal after reepithelialization. So and ultimately, we're going to use some of the high, uh, high resolution and high throughput techniques that we've already heard today, things like imaging mass cytometry, uh, digital spatial profiling, and single cell sequencing to go back to the human transplant samples and look at them at a high resolution level to understand um, genetically, uh, create sort of a genetic and cellular map uh, and understand the signaling dynamics that are occurring over the lifespan of the trachea. In the process of doing this, we're already begun broadly immunophenotyping the trachea at higher resolution that's ever pre than previously been performed. Uh, we're going to thus profile the immune landscape, not just of tracheal transplantation, but in normal and inflamed tracheas far reach, uh, with far-reaching effects to understand the role of inflammation in healing in many different disease states. So our future directions were going to be immunophenotyping the human trachea in various states, as mentioned, with higher resolution, with novel techniques, and understand epithelialization dynamics in transplant and tracheal wounds more broadly. This has far-reaching clinical applications. If chimerism is an immunoprotective mechanism, maybe we can reduce systemic immunosuppression in the tracheal transplantation and other vascularized compositive allografts long term. We can look to develop novel transplant types. As mentioned, the tracheal transplant had esophageal uh, muscularis uh, come with it. Why not do an esophagus and tracheal transplant together to fix some of these uh, life-threatening tracheoesophageal fistulas? Also, we can look at adjunct adjunctive medications to improve reepithelialization and hasten it as this is a protective mechanism early on. And working with other labs to look at the, uh, like Dr. Chen, looking at the uh, ability to uh, integrate stem cell a technology into improving these outcomes. And very briefly, I just want to talk about some of the interesting work we're also doing mapping the upper airway, um, because really before we can improve on some of the wound regeneration and prevent scarring, we need to understand on a basic level, cellular uh, level, the pathways and cells that are present, both in physiologic and pathophysiologic states. So as a prime example, work in the trachea uh, techniques have such as single cell sequencing had taken our traditional understanding and enriched it, providing new cell types and pathways that are critical to human disease. And we want to do the same for other portions of the airway, such as various components of the larynx that have been critically overlooked, probably in part due to the inability to regularly get healthy samples. Uh, we've already started to do this, getting um, <laughs> samples uh, from health, of healthy vocal poles that otherwise would have been discarded in uh, normal uh, surgical procedures that we perform. You can see the surgical bed here taking a uh, healthy uh, vocal fold mucosa in the front and performed uh, with some of our collaborators, uh, to our knowledge, the first ever single cell uh, sequencing profile of the human vocal folds. Uh, many cell types were profiled, some expected and some were really surprising. Indeed, for example, we were able to recapitulate the understanding that specialized basal epithelial cells exist in the focal fold epithelium. Um, and, but we've also been able to identify specific um, basal cell gene signatures that defines them. I think what's really surprising, however, is that we may have even found new rarer subtypes of the subset of epithelium. Club cells or clara cells, which are elsewhere in the airway, did come up in these single cell um, data sets and may be present in small degrees in the vocal folds. And these are cells that express anti-inflammatory compounds, which may be critical, uh, a critical component of the larynx to help explain how it's able to undergo such constant barrage of stress it's put under, whether it's from vibratory or sheer stress from speaking uh, to exposure to irritants in the environment. And these cells have also been implicated in, in uh, wound healing and repair. Uh, 
Uh, lastly, not surprisingly, we found fibroblasts in our samples, but what is really fascinating is that on sub-analysis, we're starting to see potentially different types of fibroblasts. While this may not all be all that unexpected, it may be key in unlocking the wound regenerative capacities of the vocal folds. Indeed, if you look at stuff in the skin, uh, recent work has been found to find subsets of fibroblasts that when activated, instead of promoting scarring, actually promote scarless wound regeneration. So if we can discover profile and co-op programs of such cells in the vocal folds and then elsewhere in the airway, this could be a game changer in terms of wound healing. Uh, so future directions on this avenue is to cr ultimately create a cellular atlas of the human vocal folds, as well as other airway, uh, portions of the upper airway, comparing to areas of the nasal, oral, subglottic, and tracheal. Uh, we can thus then look at a whole bunch of disease states and see how the cellular architecture and uh, genetic profiles change over time, as well as see how these things work out through uh, development. I'd really like to think there's a tremendous amount of people that have been involved in the various portions of these studies and so thankful to Dr. Jenden for uh, his support and efforts uh, in this as well. So just thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer any questions. I think that there's, pro you know, there, it's, we don't know yet. I think there may be an early stage, an early influx of recipient cells as some sort of protective mechanism, potentially, that's being, that some signaling is, is, is drawing in um, cells from the recipient as a, as a protective mechanism. And once maybe the inflammatory state subsides, that it goes to some sort of, you know, back to maybe donor epithelium in some degree. Um, I mean, it's something that honestly, we're going to have to look at in more tracheal transplants to see if that finding is recapitulated or if it's actually more of a plateau and we just ended up getting a sampling where it does go up to such a high level at that, that specific time point. I'm not sure yet. A lot of time we sampled different regions. Um, mostly it was near the anastomotic sites. So where the recipient and donor would be there. There are some other samples where it was more towards the mid craft and you do see in those um, actually higher percentages of recipient cells near the anastomotic site compared to the mid graph. So it may be sort of a direct migration in, but it's again, something that we're going to have to look at once we have more transplant uh, patients going forward. So one of the things we're looking to do with like with the techniques like imaging mass cytometry is try to find markers that will uh, mark donor versus recipient. So in this instance, we have X, Y, and XX. So we're trying to see if there's one that we could um, target to something on the X, Y, on the Y chromosome. So we can see that this was indeed from donor versus recipient. And that would help sort of distinguish that question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something we always talk about. And, and you know, right now we're dealing with one um, specific, you know, in the human sample, just one specific one. But I think in the, in that's why we're kind of going back to some of our animal models and doing this in the presence or absence of different amounts of immunosuppression to see how the immune response will change. And um, it's something we have to definitely look into. And, and the techniques we're used, utilizing uh, in the human samples are hopefully going to allow us to see what um, you know the immune landscape is going to look like over time. Not to any significant degree. I think it was just that this was a, this was all prior work um, 
for for years ago, but to, to some degree now. No. Yes. So the major findings were that in the presence of immunosuppression, both mouse and human were in the presence of immunosuppression, um, the epithelium would go through the initial sort of same stages of some sort of initial damage, whether it's sloughing of epithelium, maybe to an ischemic, the ischemic insult, uh, with subsequent repopulation of functional cili uh, ciliated epithelium. Um, it seems that in the mice, it was almost 100, uh, in, in the presence of immunosuppression, pretty much 100% of a chimerism, it was all a recipient in origin. In the, in the human, it seems to be a lower level, um, where it, lev it, it it's kind of levels out at a much lower percentage. Hard to, it's, I, I think it just, I think it's a little hard to kind of, a little bit apples and oranges in terms of like the exact timing. Uh, and I don't know, you know, don't know exactly the time course yet. Comparison. Right, so. 
terms of tra tracheal epithelial development? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, so it, a lot of, after injury, a lot of it will come from either the basal cell layer um, with repopulation from that. There's some evidence also that there may be some stem cell niches within like the submucosal glands that will migrate in over time. So that's another place that we're interested in potentially looking for as a, a way, as a location for which some of these cells are coming from. Um, those are the two, some of the two major ones that have been identified. I know in the lung transplant literature, there's been some that, uh, that cells may come from bone marrow derived, mode of poetic uh, derived cells as well. And that may be a factor maybe in the human as well. Great timing for my talk. We've touched on a lot of factors that I'm going to be bringing up now. Right. Well, it is such a pleasure to be here. Every talk has been fantastic today. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this community. Um, I started my assistant professor position here only two months ago, so I'm brand new. Um, and I'm in the Department of Cell Developmental and Regenerative Biology and the Department of Otolaryngology. And really, this is the most ideal environment for me. I'm a developmental biologist by training, and my lab uses developmental biology to understand mechanisms of organ morphogenesis, but also to understand pathways and cellular dynamics that go awry in disease states, particularly of the upper airway in the nose and the sinuses. So today, I'm going to specifically talk about one um, interesting project in our lab. We are interested in multiple different dynamics of epithelial growth and homeostasis. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about CFTR and gland morphogenesis. So exocrine glands are found throughout our entire body and basically they're secretory epithelial organs critical for maintaining homeostasis in almost every tissue. So examples are the salivary glands in our oral cavity that secrete saliva that protects our teeth, aids in chewing and speech and of course digestion. We've got ocular glands such as the lacrimal and the meibomian glands, they secrete tears and more oily like um, substances to protect our ocular surfaces and of course we have the exocrine pancreas that is essential in um, creating digestive enzymes that we need for breaking down food and nutrition absorption but my lab um, is particularly focused in the exocrine organs of the airway known as the submucosal glands that we've been mentioning in in multiple talks today um, and while we have important goblet cells and secretory cells of the surface airway epithelium, the majority of the mucus in our airway is produced by these mucus producing machines. So as the name goes, they're found in the submucosal layer and we have the highest density of glands in the nose and the sinuses. This makes absolute sense because that's the first line of defense we need for all that toxic air coming into our nose directly, especially in New York City. Um, in humans, then, we find the submucosal glands. I've seen them in, in micrographs of multiple um, people's biopsies. We find them in the trachea and all the way down to the bronchi in humans. Um, and in mice, they just extend to the, and the proximal trachea, which also might be an interesting thing why we see these differences in regeneration in the mice and human tracheal transplant model. So typically, um, they have a classic exocrine cellular composition made of secretory cells and a network of tubules. In the airway glands, we have distal serous cells, which produce watery-like secretion rich in bacteriocidal enzymes, such as lactoferrin and lysozyme. This secretion then is transported through a tubule lined by mucus secretory cells. So these are rich in glycosylated proteins that give airway mucus that sticky function, it need, the consistency it needs for mucociliary clearance. In the submucosal glands, the predominant mucus is MUC5B, um, Monica was discussing earlier about MUC5AC, that's more predominantly expressed in the goblet cell. So MUC5B is enriched in these mucus tubules. 
then collected um, together, this airway mucus goes through a collecting duct and then it's propelled into the airway lumen by a ciliated duct and of course then cilia on top of the surface epithelium. Now, glad I included these in this micro in this image. We also have myoepithelial cells. So these are funky cells that kind of wrap around all the epithelial cells. Traditionally, from studies in the mammary gland and other exocrine organs, it's been thought that these cells act in, in applying pressure to squeeze out the mucus. But of course, with all our modern technology and, and asking the right questions, we see that there's intercellular relationships and signaling going on between myopithelial cells and submucosal cells. And of course, John Inglehart's lab showed a few years ago though, that under extreme injury, these myoepithelial cells can transdifferentiate and replenish the surface epithelium of the trachea with I will say extreme naphthalene injury. So with other forms of injury, we might have different populations replenishing different epithelial compartments. Um, so in my lab, we love to take tissue sections and do beautiful immunostaining and use high, res high resolution confocal microscopy. And I'll be showing multiple images today, but just to show you, this is a submucosal gland of a human trachea. And you can see it's very similar to the, the traditional schematic where you've distal secretory cells, Serous cells are negative for MUC5B, our mucus cells are positive. And then within this beautiful luminized collecting duct, you can see the MUC5B positive mucus on its way to the airway lumen to carry out its protective function. So as you can imagine, being the main mucus producers of the airway, we're interested in the role these glands play in multiple airway diseases, both hyposecretory and hypersecretory. And today I wanna to talk to you about cystic fibrosis that Jamie perfectly introduced already. And um, so as described, this is an autosomal recessive disease where, which caused by mutations in the CFDR gene, which can give rise to multiple different types of malformations in the protein, but ultimately you have non-functioning protein or dysfunctional protein at the apical membrane of epithelial cells, which inhibits those that transport of chloride ions, as Jamie was talking about, and also in exocrine organs, it plays a role in bicarbonate iron transport. So cystic fibrosis is really an exocrine disease. Um, all our exocrine um, organs are significantly impacted by mutations in CFDR. And this leads to abnormal mucus secretion. So we see this in the pancreas, we see it in the intestine, but most predominantly we see it in the airway. So we have um, airway mucus plugging um, within the conductive airways. And instead of mucus killing bacteria and transporting it away from the lung, it's actually changed in its consistency and provides an environment that bacteria thrive in. And so a lot of CF patients suffer from chronic infection and lung um, disease is the leading cause of CF related morbid morbidity and mortality. Now, amazing research has been carried out for decades on the distal lung and CF. Um, but it's interesting, the nose and the sinuses haven't really had the same attention and this is quite surprising considering almost 100 percent of cf patients would develop nasal mucus plug plugging or a syndrome we refer to as chronic rhinosinusitis which i'm sure many of you have heard of in this room so this is the chronic accumulation of mucus in the nose and the sinuses leading to decreased decreased drainage infection of course chronic facial pain and difficulty breathing um, so just to appreciate this further this is a ct frontal scan of a healthy patient and we can see the beautiful aerated sinus maxillary sinuses and the nasal cavity shown by the, 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 the black um, spaces in the CT scan. When we compare this to a, a patient with chronic rhinosinusitis, we see intensive plugging of the sinonasal cavities. And so we obviously have inflammation of the mucous membranes, but I don't know if you can appreciate here, there's a lighter um, gray. This tells us that that um, maxillary sinus is filled with inspissated mucus. Now, another thing that's coming out in the last few years is that we're also seeing that the nasal environment contributes at large to the distal lung environment. And we see this with CF lung transplant patients that have their healthy donor lungs. Over time, they'll get reinfected. And we can look at microbiome studies um, comparing the nose to the lung. And we can see that a lot of what's going on in the nose will soon um, um, travel to so we're interested um, in understanding the role of CFDR in this mucus accumulation. And of course, we're looking at the submucosal glands. So what do we know of the involvement of these glands in CF? Well, as I mentioned, many labs have been focusing on the distal lung. 
So the, the submucosal glands in the bronchi um, were first described that the serous distal secretory cells of the glands in the bronchus um, was the predominant site of CFDR expression. And more recently, we've got many models now of cystic fibrosis, such as the ferret, sheep, and the pig. And we can see that there's a direct impaired mucus detachment from, um, from the submucosal glands in the trachea and the bronchi. And I will mention Michael Welsh and John Inglehart. There's a fantastic CF um, research institute in Iowa that developed a lot of these models. Um, but we can also go back to, you know, older studies, which were analyzing um, histological biopsies from CF fetal tissue. And early in um, fetal development, we see abnormal cellular patterning and inspissated mucus blocking mucus tubules in the glands um, as early as 19 weeks in the fetus. So what do we know of the upper airway? Well, not as much. Um, again, in the adult, we see different secretory rates directly from the submucosal glands in chronic rhinosinusitis, non-CF and also CF-related CRS. Um, and then again, in early postnatal pigs, we do see defective fluid secretion coming from the glands in early, uh, um, uh, this is actually these were at birth. So all of this data indicates in CF being a congenital disorder, that maybe CFDR is playing a role in early organ development and cellular patterning. And um, so that is what the question that we are asking and we're looking at er the role of CFDR in these, in these mechanisms. So we use the mouse as a model system during my PhD in London, <clears throat> A few years ago now, um, I characterize a lot of the upper airway glands in the mouse. And there's an extensive array of glands within the mouse model that really I pushed that are providing a beautiful model system for human air and gland development. They're quite different from the glands we see in the trachea and the bronchi. Um, as you can imagine, the nose is a complex space. There's a lot of surface area, area and moving through cartilage. Um, so how these glands form, and we see this similarly in the human, is in the mouse during embryogenesis, we have ductal elongation. So the ducts initiate near the nostrils and then the ducts elongate towards the sinus cavities found at the back of the eye in the um, mouse model. And after two days of ductal elongation, we have branching morphogenesis of the distal secretory gland. So not only do they have multiple differentiated cell types, so this is a sagittal section through these glands. This is the maxillary sinus cavity. We have the stenos gland, which is very similar to the majority of glands in the human. And you can see mucus production during early development occurring before birth. And then we also have multiple serous glands, um, which again, we find in the human. So while we have similar cell types as the human model system, we also have a model system that will provide us to study different aspects of gland morphogenesis, such as ductal elongation and secretory cell branching. So we went to early development in the mouse to see if CFDR is expressed. Um, and there's generally not a, a reliable antibody um, considered in the field of CFDR. So we actually use in situ hybridization here shown in fluorescence labeling. And we can see at E15.5 during early branching of the airway glands, we have enrichment of CFDR transcripts in the ductal system, as well as these new buds forming, which are branching and will become the future secretory cells. And of course, you see um, expression of CFDR transcripts. This is the respiratory epithelium, the surface epithelium of the maxillary sinus, but which we know CFDR is expressed in, but you can see that the difference in enrichment of the, 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 the expression of CFDR is abundant within the early gland epithelium. Um, we've had some human fetal samples as well, um, and we also see this is a 22-week-old um, nasal gland. We're finding transcript in the ductal compartment as well as the distal um, acinar cells, which have differentiated at this late stage. But with Dr. Chen and others at the BFSCI, we're, we're going to investigate um, human fetal development and CFDR expression. So next, as developmental biologists, we asked, okay, well, what if we delete CFDR during organ, organ formation? So we use a similar model, then introduced the K14 mouse. So we use an inducible K14 CRE cross to the CFDR flux allele. What this allows us is delete CFDR during early development um, in K14 cells. And as these K14 cells give rise to the glands, which we've defined in the nose and the mouse model system, these basal K14 cells give rise to the glands during development. So within our litters, we will have wild type tissue. So the glands will have CFDR expressed. 
And then in the same litters, we also have a CFDR conditional knockouts where we've deleted CFDR in the progenitors and thus their progeny. So we delete CFDR at E10 and E11.5 prior to gland ontogenesis, and then we allow them to develop to E15.5 and we analyzed their phenotype. So this is a cross section of the stenos gland, which is again, similar to the human lateral glands. Um, and when we take a tissue section, we can stain it for all our favorite um, protein markers that tell us what cell types are present. So you can see the primary duct, a beautiful luminized structure, and this is leading into multiple branches. So as you can imagine, it's a cross section. So this duct is connected to, to these end buds right here. And we use SOX10. SOX10 um, has, is a um, early acinar cell marker. So those secretory cells um, express SOX10 when they're, they've lineage and um, they've committed towards a secretory cell um, lineage. And so what we see is when we label the early gland for SOX10, we can see enrichment in the end buds, which we expect is these are the cells to give rise to the secretory cells. When we look at the CFDR conditional knockout, we see a striking phenotype in the glands. Most predominantly is we have no clear luminization of the pri pri primary duct. Um, and then we also don't have multiple branches from this duct. We just have one single endpoint. We do find SOX2 expression, suggesting that there is some lineage commitment arising. However, the gland is not undergoing its usual branching morphogenesis. Then when we look closely in the ductal compartment, we also see sporadic SOX10 expression within this ductal compartment, which we never find within the wild type tissue. So we hypothesize that this could maybe be some altered cell identity occurring with the loss of CFDR, or maybe these were initial branch points that, could, that couldn't really succeed, um, like we see in the, um, the, the uh, wild type tissue. So when we look closer at this end bud morphology and we stain with ZO1 apical marker and e cadherin to label our um, epithelial cells, we see um, in the wild type at this E15.5, these end bud cells are starting to surround themselves around a central lumen. You know, in the next two days, they're going to be producing mucus and they need that lumen to um, secrete the mucus into. So this lumen is lined by ZO1 as the apex of the cells will, will kind of carve out the lumen. And so we see this beautiful staining in the wild type. However, when we look at the CFDR conditional knockout, we have significant loss of ZO1, and it seems to be in low expression and multiple um, 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 polarity, uh, both at the basal and um, uh, apical regions of each cell. Now, I will say CFDR has been associated with the ZO1 and apical um, and polar polarization of cells in multiple organs and CF models. So we hope to, to look into this further. Um, and so when we investigate the lumen phenotype a bit more, we can see there's a significant reduction in lumen diameter of the CFDR knockout. And to understand maybe what's causing this, we looked at cellular proliferation within this ductal compartment and we stained for K14, which is our basal progenitor cells. And then the K14 negative cells are, are differentiated luminal cells. And when we stain for KI67 to analyze cell proliferation, what we see is there's no significant difference in proliferation rates of our basal cells. However, we have hyperproliferation within the differentiated cell compartment which makes sense as CFDR is enriched in the luminal cells as opposed to these basal, basal progenitors. Um, so I'll quickly also introduce that um, for over 10 years, I've also worked on the salivary gland. Um, and in human patients, we also see abnormalities in salivary gland tissue. So within this mouse model, we also looked at the salivary glands at the same time point. And so we have two salivary glands. We have the sublingual here and the submandibular salivary gland. And you can see beautifully, they have an elongated duct and um, branched acini at E15.5. When we compare this to the CFDR conditional knockout, we can see that the, the branching of the, the gland is significantly reduced. And while we do have a, a ductal, a ductal um, structure elongating, when we look closer at the duct, again, we have lost luminization of the duct compared to the wild type. And also we have a significant reduction. So more recently, we've processed this glandular tissue for bulk RNA sequencing to see if we can understand a bit more about the genetic mechanisms driving these developmental defects. And so what we see here is interestingly enough, with the loss of CFDR, we've 205 down-regulated genes. 
um, when we have 526 upregulated genes, which as a developmental biologist doesn't really happen a lot. When you delete something, sometimes everything goes down. So this is a really interesting data set now because we see that multiple things, multiple different pathways and gene signatures might be altered with loss of CFDR. And so when we do gene ontology analysis, when we um, investigate the down-regulated genes with the loss of CFDR, we see similar pathways to um, biological processes um, reflecting our um, histological analysis. So we've cytoskeletal organization, cell-to-cell -cell junctions, transport, of course, which we expect is deleting an ion channel. And then we also have um, uh, hits associated with epithelial cell differentiation. When we look at our upregulated genes, again, it, kind of, it, it goes really nicely with what we're seeing in the tissue. We have changes in cell to cell signaling, tube development, and early morphogenesis. So we're hypothesizing that CFDR is required for later, cell, later stages of differentiation and with loss of CFDR, the glands maybe go in, in overdrive of early developmental processes. Um, what's interesting as well as I've included is we also see changes, see hits associated with blood vessel morphogenesis and neurogenesis. I think this is a really important point. M many people today have been talking about different cell populations um, within the, the airway associated with the epithelia. And even when we only delete CFDR in the epithelium, we see changes in multiple different tissue types, which is very important to consider. Um, because as we know, there's so much crosstalk going on within the entire system. Um, so in a nutshell, I also just want to describe what we do in the lab. If you've anyone looking for a position, friends, family, whoever, um, I'm hiring at all levels. And what we're doing is um, one thing, and we've touched on it, a few people have touched on this today, we do not understand the stem cell population of these organs, which is critical in terms of developmental biology and of course, airway disease. So one of our um, big projects funded by NHLBI is we are using multiomic sequencing techniques to map airway nasal gland development in the human fetus over developmental time. So this is a perfect um, uh, system because obviously we have stem cells in forming glands for the first time. And by taking different time points, we can create this cell atlas and see what's driving um, gland development, but also if we have changes in cell populations um, that, provide, that supply each different aspect of glands. And other organs we see in adult glands, like secretory cells have their own stem cell, ductal cells have their own stem cell. We don't really understand what's going on in the, in the um, the airway glands. So this is one big uh, project that we have going. Of course, as I've described, we use in vivo model systems. I'm hoping to, um, um, over the next year, um, create a, quite a decent CF mice model colony. Craig Hodges in, in um, Case Western has created fantastic mice looking at even humanized mice. So they've replaced the CFDR allele in mice with the human allele because I will say uh, the mouse CFDR protein is about 70% similar to human, which again, I think is important to keep in mind. So it'd be fantastic to get the humanized mouse model and also they've created specific CF um, mutations in these mice so we can actually look at potentiators and correctors in the mouse model and see how this influences epithelial morphology. And of course, with collaboration from the Department of Otolaryngology, we hope to really investigate chronic rhinosinusitis, um, not just the, air, the airway glands, but also the surface epithelium and the entire um, epithelial niche, because as a, quite a prevalent syndrome, we know very little of, of chronic rhinosinusitis. And so just some quick acknowledgements. I wouldn't be here without the independent freedom um, I was given by my previous mentor, Sarah Knox, during my K99 phase, where I moved from the saliva gland into the airway. Um, and also the Department of Otolaryngology at UCSF kind of started my whole passion for, for ENT and looking at the, the nose and the sinuses. And of course, Walt Finkbeiner has been extremely helpful in my CF related research. Um, and although I've just arrived, everybody in the CDRB, otolaryngology, BFSCI, and I'm a new member of the Skin Biology and Disease Resource Center, everyone has been fantastic. And I'm just really happy to be part of this community and excited to collaborate with everyone. Um, so big thank you to my um, funding, CF Foundation, a fantastic funding basic science.
um, and of course NHLBI. Um, and yeah, many job opportunities in the May Lab. And as of this week, we've established our website if you want to find out more. So thank you very much. I think I would never say instead of um, two things with the ferret model, it's very expensive. And it's also um, the mortality rate is very high, which technically is a good thing because it, it, it replicates a similar lung disease and intestinal disease as the, the, as the human disease. Um, I think, so a week ago, NHLBI had a CFF um, a conference bringing the, the community together. And I think what our lab will want to do is collaborate with the folks already establishing the models rather than create our own um, our own um, colony. More so, the, the idea of that conference was to bring everyone together to, trigger, to start collaboration. So, and again, not a lot of people look at the nose. So I think it will be easy, and especially with all, all of you with other projects as well, is to you can send us nasal samples and we can work together and I think that would be the way but I think you make a great point the pig and the ferret model have been very important in understanding the disease especially of exocrine glands and the sheep is actually looking pretty good too yeah it go even bigger <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a really, really great question because I think even in terms of the CF field, we're seeing these epigenetic factors kicking in. When I originally applied for the grant, which seems like a long time ago now, I just was applying for single cell sequencing. But the plan is now in the next few months is we, we're going multi multi -on. and with a with a focus on the epigenetics. But I I, I don't have any data data of that right now. But it's definitely the plan, especially with the um, developmental apps for sure. A really 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 great question and in my longer talk i think i go a bit more into this we're just looking at one time shot of development our next stages is to allow those glands to develop for, further the thing is in this tissue so in cf even in the fetal tissue and postnatal tissue the glands are there we don't have complete loss of glands we do have mucus production of course we do we see the lungs full of them full of mucus what i think is there will be branching morphogenesis to some extent, and there will be cellular differentiation of secretory cells to some extent. Another phenotype that we all know is that the, the glands have dilated lumens, which you might say is the opposite of what I'm showing. So what, what we are thinking is later in development, you have differentiation of those fewer secretory cells. Of course, the chloride channel has been mutated or lost in this case. So it's, it's an abnormal mucus. It's then reaching a duct that's closed off. And of course, with that pressure, then that might lead to the dilation of the duct. So, you know, I might have just looked out and chose a time point where we're seeing this embryonically, but the next questions are to see what happens as we continue and, and see even get to the postnatal stage and see can we phenocopy what we actually see in the airway, which is quite different to what I've described. <laughs> 
So thanks a lot for having me present. So I'm a epithelial biologist by training. I would see myself somewhere between cell biology and developmental biology. And the interest of my lab has been in cell polarity and signaling pathways that regulate that. And so there's lots of potential for collaboration. And also my own interest has kind of went into the area of uh, airway epithelial biology quite a bit. And one of my former postdocs who started his own lab in Spain a couple of years ago, he actually switched completely from working on flies to airway epithelia. And I will show you some of his work that kind of led us to that. So this is just, it's a, it's a nice picture. It was also on the cover of Nature Cell Biology. But the point I try to make here is that you can see in the, so we were using the fly epithelial tissue and it's super easy to study it. So that's why probably, uh, if not everything that's known about PCP comes from flies, then the big majority that has been then also shown to be conserved in mammals uh, came originally from insect and mostly Drosophila work. And so what you see here, the cells marked in green are sort of like a chimeric, so it's a chimeric tissue in a sense. It's in a wild type context, we misexpress uh, gene of interest. This is a wind factor and that repolarizes the cells surrounding this patch. So you can see, for example, here on on the right side of the patch that cells turn around and instead of going from left to right as they would in the uh, normal area they they repolarize and even the wild type cells so it's a it's a non-autonomous function here because it's a signaling from cell to cell so inside the patch you see sort of semi-random uh, orientation and outside the patch you see orientation towards the, the tissue so I'll, i just want to emphasize that we can do these kind of things and the tissues we really work with in the lab are sort of threefold, the Drosophila eye, the wing, and the body wall proper. So you have the eye here that is actually a very complex uh, uh, tissue in a sense that there are neuronal cells, um, um, photoreceptor neurons. They arrange in a very specific, pa uh, specific pattern that's regulated by that. You have individual polarity here. Each of these cells makes an actin here, and I'll come back to that because that's actually relevant to ciliary uh, polarization and patterning. And then on the body wall, it's the sensory cells that are multiciliated units, but under those, if you zoom in and would look at it in higher magnification, you would also see these individual actin-based cells. So just to put everybody on the same plane, we're looking at the planar polarity. So within the plane of the epithelium, and you've seen in many of the talks earlier today, these multiciliated cells in the in the trachea and in other parts of the of the airway, and those are basically arranged within the plane. So they are on the apical side of each cell, like in this case a, a cytoskeletal based structure that in this case an actin based structure, and then they are arranged so they're on one side of the cell or they're oriented towards one side of the cell, and this is coordinated across the whole tissue rather than sort of being randomly established and then uh, said. So this is obviously an example. Uh, the, where the fly uh, can lead the way, but we don't study it in the fly for the sake of you know, understanding how the, the Drosophila polarity is established, but this, this is a list of, a growing list of um, events that have been nicely characterized in the, in the mammalian context. And obviously the one highlighted in, the, in red here is the cell polarization in airway epithelial systems, where the multiciliated uh, cells uh, need to be properly polarized for the mucociliary transport to be efficient, otherwise, transport would be kind of random in direction and hence it would never get out of the area where it should be removed. But as you can see, this is uh, epithelial polarity is significant to many, many uh, sensory and other epithelial tissues. So again, we're using these systems and I'll talk a little bit, I won't talk about any other tissue today, but the wing. And I'll just use it as an example, how we actually got into uh, being interested into um, more the airway epithelia. So this is from a review that I actually that uh, Gemma Carvajal Gonzalez, the postdoc that I mentioned, that switched completely from Drosophila to airway in Spain because he was in an institution where they told him he cannot work with flies. It was too complicated to establish, and he was he started with flies, drove two hours to Sevilla every other week to get uh, sort of infrastructure and reagents from them, but then he gave up and just switched to the airway. So he's he's doing very well on that. So this is. Uh, you see here, basically, this would be like a single cell within this epithelial sheet of the, the wing blade, which is this very simple epithelium that uh, is every cell is almost identical and they, they make these uh, actin protrusions. And so you have two complexes that basically need to be polarized across the field. One, uh, one side of the cell has one complex here uh, in green, which is the frizzled uh, receptor-based complex. 
on the other side is the Van Gogh Van Gogh like uh, receptors and this is now looking at uh, cells in the in the airway epithelia where you have the same kind of complexes this is a sort of a mouse uh, view of this and the difference is that in flies for each of these genes we have one gene so it's easy to do uh, genetics there's no redundancy and it's a little more uh, sort of manageable in the mouse you have multiple frizzles you have two vangles you have multiple dishevels etc so all these proteins that we need to knock down or misexpress or manipulate there's lots of redundancy in the mammalian system so it makes it a little harder if you want to test specific point mutations for rescue or etc so but the, the principles are the same and so just in a sort of a higher view of the scheme so the, the scheme is that across an epithelial sheet you establish complexes that would be anchored by the uh, Van Vangel proteins on one side or the frizzle proteins on the other side and they bridge from cell to cell by direct binding of frizzle to Vang but also by a uh, seven passions membrane catherin that provides additional adhesive uh, strength and, and stabilizes these complexes so there's in a sort of classical sense there is a positive feedback loop across cells through stabilization and there's negative feedback loop destabilization between cells so within the cell so each complex kind of doesn't like the other complex being nearby and kicks it off so you have cellular polarization across that and then you have lots of effector effects so you get actin for example being regulated by that one complex promoting actin the other complex inhibiting actin and i'll show you in a, in a couple of slides further that downstream of that actin is for example the positioning and the polarization of the cilia that are critical in many aspects and there's still some things that haven't been confirmed in vertebrates so for example a selectin family member called furrowed flies which my lab has discovered a few years ago to be contributing uh, similar to the flamingo the blue gene here the fmi has not been really shown yet in mammalian context again most likely due to redundancy because there are several selectins in the zebrafish in the mouse and so people have sort of shied away from uh, looking at that and so the key thing is also that the polarization is across the whole field it's not just individual cells and so when you have a you have a field of basically polarization that every cell adopts the same orientation and every cell will be adopting orientation that's in part influenced by the neighbor and if everything goes well they're all in sync they're all aligned and this is generally uh, mediated by uh, localized wind expression that is either functioning by a graded uh, effect on the on the epithelial field or also by sort of cell to cell communication by tessellation effect that once a few cells near the source are being established and then they propagate it by again uh, adhesive asymmetric adhesive mechanisms so just to come back to sort of uh, the relevance to epithelial uh, cells in the airway so this would be again one of the simple uh, cells in the fly wing which ha don't have any visible cilia but they can make cilia if they would become uh, neuronal but they have centrioles, which are basically the non-ciliary basal body. So if you look at the um, primary cilium, you have two basal bodies sitting at the base, hence the name basal body of the cilium. And if you now look in uh, multiciliated cells, they are polarized. This, when I copied things from one computer to another and then on this one, something happened here. So these lines that go across, please ignore them. This is some sort of computer glitch. But the key thing is that the cilia get oriented within the cell to the one side and they also orient themselves to, it is in the field of the epithelia so over time these complexes recruit the basal bodies the centrioles to one side of the cell and then these are then multiplied by uh, ampl ampl amplification of uh, the basal body the genome and the formation of multiciliated cells every epithelia for example have two to three hundred so it's cilia per cell, as you all know. And so in both in the Drosophila wing, these centrioles initially start in the middle. And then by this interaction with these uh, plain cell polarity complexes, they get localized to the frizzled side, the frizzled disheveled side of the complex. And if it's now just a centriole or if it's a basal body that will give rise to cilia, the mechanism seems to be very much the same. And if things go wrong, if you're mutant for PCP, so for example, again, Drosophila wing cell, centrioles would be on the side of the frizzle complex in a PCP mutant they're randomly oriented it is in the cell if you now look at the multiciliated cell for example in the trachea then they are all on one side and they point also in one direction so because they are polarized cilia in that sense if you look at a primary cilium in the inner ear it's also on one side and then it polarizes the cytoskeleton so again in all these systems the cells 
pol polarized within the field and they can read the information that's there. And so I will sort of uh, inroads into interest in cilia was that we discovered that at the base of these hairs, and this I sort of jumping ahead, but here we are, so the summary is that at the base, at the, if you extend these uh, centrioles to the um, further apical, you have this actin-based uh, polymerization machinery that will generate the actin-based hair. And so a actin-based hair in the Drosophila wing is to some extent similar to a primary cilium. And so we discovered that these centrioles sit at the base of these hairs and that the actin-based hair is basically a, if you want to simplify it, sort of a modified cilia restructure because it also has stable acetylated tubulin, which is a hallmark of cilia at the base of this hair. And so now if we look at it over time, and this is again something that's important in context of uh, growing, you know, growing organoids or growing uh, tissue that could be used for uh, regenerative applications, it starts off in an unpolarized manner. And then as the tissue gets polarized, giving rise to these hairs, the centrioles are highly polarized and sit basically on one side of the cell and that's where they should be. And this is also where, if you would look at a <coughs> ciliated epithelial cell, that's where the cilium would be. So again, this is just a complex here that the model that over time in the context of supply it takes just a few hours in more complicated or mammalian systems, it takes a couple of days. But if we go from a unpolarized cell to a polarized cell that places the cilia in a, a very specific area and po polarizes the cilia as well. If we now remove some of these uh, plain cell polarity genes, so you kind of lose this polarity. So instead of being localized to the distal area of the cell here, it's randomly oriented. These are two examples here, flamingo being the cadherin, frizzle being frizzled itself. If you mis-express the PCP genes, you achieve the same thing. So you mispolarize these complexes and you mispolarize cilia. Hence, uh, we can also genetically manipulate these things. So instead of having polarity going from proximal to distal, we're having polarity going inverse. If we genetically modify this, so we can, by mis-expressing one of these factors, we can kind of switch the orientation by the, providing a different response to the underlying uh, wind gradients. And we can also show, for example, that the actin cytoskeletal uh, polymerization machinery is between the PCP complexes and polarization of the cells. So if you, if you interfere with actin polymerization, uh, the multiple wing hair gene is a antiformin. So if you remove that regulatory element, then the cells become mispolarized again and the cilia or the centriole moves to the center because the machinery that places the cilia in, in a particular spot has been lost. Yeah, and so let's see, I can kind of skip through that. If you, so just one point here, this is clearly a downstream effect. So if you remove cilia or centrioles, and these are actually acentrioles cells, so this is kind of a, uh, normally these cells would be considered sick and they, if you let them, if you do let them grow, they actually, even in flies, they can start forming uh, uh, tumors. Uh, you don't need the cilia for the planar polarization. So it's like a secondary step. So first you have polarization, then cilia follows. And you can make multiciliated cells or multicentrioles cells that normally have only two centrioles. And they will always go again as wild type, they will go to the distal edge, to the distal end. So again, in the multiciliated cells, like in the area epithelia, if you have hundred of these, they will all be polarized in the same axis. The system can uh, regulate that. So our work in that context has sort of identified for the first time when you look at a lot of tissues, the, um, there's also the question, what's the sort of major or the, the most critical readout of this PCP signaling? If you look at it sort of in a really global and evolutionary sense, and it seems that positioning of centrioles, basal body, cilia is the most, uh, is the conserved uh, readout. And you can detect that in any tissue you look at where you can have markers for uh, basal bodies or centrioles. And so this is deconserved PCP effect or readout. And other as aspects are then more tissue specific. And just to kind of bring it back to um, the area epithelia, this is examples from a paper from uh, Jeff Axtros lab that was published recently. This shows uh, polarization in the, uh, in the tracheal epithelia. And it started before coelogenesis, there's a little bit of polarity detected with uh, the tools that 
they have by antibodies and uh, measuring priority during ciliogenesis, it grows. And at the end of ciliogenesis, when you have these multiciliated cells, as shown here with these markers, you have very robust polarity, again, within the proximal distal axis in the trachea, which you can visualize here by showing basically asymmetry of the uh, Bangl-1 gene, which is one of the mouse homologs of, of Bang. And again, ECAD herein is sort of here showing the same. And what's also important here, and it's interesting also as a follow-up to uh, Ali, Ali May's talk, if you look at the, these are now the samples from human tissue from the, in the same study, if you look at healthy uh, human tissue, there's this similar polarization, Bangle protein, and is on one side of the cell, frizzle proteins are on the other within the proximal distal axis, as you can see here in the, in the middle panel on, on the right. If you look at CF or CSR, the uh, chronic rhinocytis, the polarity is either randomized, so there is vanglet protein expression is there, but you don't see polarity. It's kind of randomly distributed in the uh, junctional apical membrane, or it's reduced as in the context of CSR. If you then look at e-cadherin, it's still there, so the cells kind of still know what they are and that they are epithelial, but they kind of lost some of the sense. So it, Matters a little bit to now to start addressing what comes first. Is it because these cells don't have proper cilia, or is it because the polarity has become wrong and ciliogenesis has been uh, affected? And as a last sample here, this is from a uh, re very recent paper, couple, uh, like yeah, eight eight months ago from uh, Omori's lab at the University of Kyoto. They were growing um, um, tracheal sort of. Uh, culture on a, in a in a sponge uh, like structure and normally polarity again would be along the vertical axis here proximal to distal and you can see that quite nicely of staining this for frizzle six and vangle one and if you look at the border of these two cells on one side is frizzled on the other side is vang so this is very similar to what we see in the flies but now when you look in these uh, sort of the uh, grown tissue you get random polarization that's not quite random but it points towards the edges of the the tissue, the grown tissue. So, for example, if you're in the proximal side, it'll polarity will be proximal. If you're on the left side, polarity will be to the left, etc. So, suggesting that these cells want to polarize, but they're missing some information to polarize in a coordinated manner across the tissue. And the result is then that. And the next slide is a, uh, yeah, this is I can skip that. This also got sort of messed up in the transfer, but what they nicely showed also that the transport, the mucociliary transport in this tissue still works but it basically follows the polarity of these cells. So on the left side, it would be to the left rather than proximal, on the right side to the right rather than proximal, and only in the area that's proximal in the, in the uh, engineer tissue, it'll go into the right direction, which would be up the airway uh, towards the mouth. So this, uh, hopefully, this sort of shows you that if we can manipulate or if we can provide uh, positional cues to uh, tissue grown in the dish uh, ex vivo, it, we, can, we might be able to add proper polarity to these cells. And so you, if you, for example, want to use a uh, transplant type uh, um, experiment where you take a ex vivo grown uh, tracheal tissue, for example, it, you need to also consider adding the proper polarity cues and making sure that polarity is established along this line. And I think, yeah, so I'll stop here. And again, just want to say again, we know what the genes are, we know which players are involved. There are several kinases here that are left out that are also regulated by these pathways. And so it's a combination of protein stability and protein regulation that's mediated by the wind uh, gradients that provides a very robust polarization across the whole field, hundreds, thousands of cells. And this is important for the tissue function in many contexts. And most of the work I spoke uh, was from Chema Carvajal, who here he is, and he, just before the pandemic, he moved back to Spain, and during the pandemic, because he couldn't write to Sevilla all the time, he started working on airway epithelia, and it's going well. So he'll be also happy to come back and maybe present his results. Thanks so much. Any questions? That's fine. Thanks. It's been a pleasure attending this.
I think it, there's a critical mass here of interdisciplinary expertise that showed that we're going to be able to fulfill the goals that you set out at the beginning to be able to help each other in our collaborative projects. We have different areas of focus in terms of the scientific approaches we use and the systems we use and the resources we have. And, and I think it's really clear that continuing these types of sessions with more in depth presentations of projects and progress would be really fruitful to move the science forward in the airway sciences. So really excited to be a part of it. I'll share with you today a project that's going on in our group. We're focusing on lung cancer. We haven't talked about lung cancer much today. And we're going to talk about a specific subtype of lung cancer. And the subtype of lung cancer we're going to talk about is early stage lung adenocarcinoma, which is the most common type of lung cancer. And even though more individuals will die of advanced stage lung cancer, where there have been multiple advances that have had a huge impact on survival of lung cancer, there's still quite a bit of ways to go for early stage lung cancer, where the five-year survival rate tops out at about 70%, which is really still quite low. So a lot of the attention has been focused on earlier detection of lung cancer. And that's done with CT scans that give images like you see on the top. And in patients who have lung cancer and in patients who don't have lung cancer, a frequent finding is something just like this, this little hazy opacity here. We call that a ground glass opacity. And, in, and this is a pretty common finding and it can be caused by a variety of different conditions. But when this is present and when it persists, a period of several months, it's pretty darn likely that the pathology underlying that opacity is a cancer and a lung cancer. But it's going to be very likely to be a very indolent type of cancer that if you took it out and did a pathological evaluation, looked like bottom left, where there's tumor here, but the tumor is really nicely organized and lines the alveolar membrane. And this is now called an in situ adenocarcinoma. Very similar in terms of clinical course, what we see in many individuals with prostate cancer, where more men will die with prostate cancer than of prostate cancer. However, some of these tumors over time can acquire properties that allow them to invade and then metastasize. And then of course be a, a, a cause of poor outcomes. And when those tumors come out, they look like the bottom right, where you can see that there's an aggressive deposition of, of stroma, disorganization, which allows then the tumor cells to invade into the lymph, invade into the vasculature, and, and distally metastasize. And they're correlates of this pathological process on imaging that you can see on the top, where that hazy opacity that we saw on the left over time, a year, two years, becomes a little bit whiter, which correlates with the solid component, and that progresses over time. Our lab intends to understand the biological processes that drive the progression of cancer, in some cases, from this indolent type of tumor on the bottom left to the aggressive tumor on the bottom right. So here's the model where we're starting, in this case, with the adenocarcinoma in situ, and then the tumor can progress through stages of invasiveness and then can lead to metastasis. A work that we've done in the past has characterized early stage lung adenocarcinomas to identify key pathways that may drive this process. We identified that loss of the type two TGF beta receptor was commonly detected in the invasive versus the indolent tumors. We created a mouse model where we combined the oncogenic KRAS model, which is classically used to model lung adenocarcinoma, we crossed that animal with an, a TGF-BR2 knockout. And we showed that we could recapitulate in a mouse the pathological and the biological and the genomic progression that we could see in human tumors. And then we went on to identify some of the downstream mediators that are elaborated when TGF beta signaling is disrupted. So what I'm gonna talk about today is more recent work where we've built upon the findings that I showed you just before, and we've done now a, a larger bulk RNA sequencing experiment 
in 53 early stage lung adenocarcinomas. And this was an important data set to generate because it's not available in the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a really nice repository for more advanced lung cancers, but doesn't contain these adenocarcinomas in situ that we're talking about. So we were able to collect them, characterize them, and we did this uh, as a strong collaborative effort between our group here at Sinai, also involves Hideo, the group at Semaphore that involves Jun Zhu and Sang Yol Yu, and also uh, strong uh, collaborations from Cornell, particularly Alan Borzak, pathologist there. So for these 53 tumors, some were invasive, some were not. With uh, unsupervised clustering, they were segregated, and then the invasive tumors are on the left, and then the non-invasive tumors are on the right, and then we were able to identify an invasiveness signature comprised about 1,300 genes here, of which 520 were upregulated in the invasive tumors, and 800 were upregulated in the more indolent tumors. So then we wanted to understand what the biological and clinical significance would be of these signatures. So what we did is to determine the clinical impact of these signatures, we determined the survival outcomes in patients who had lung adenocarcinomas evaluated by RNA sequence analysis. And these cohorts come from around the globe, Europe, Japan, United States. And we then compared the survival in patients who had a signature that was upregulated in invasive tumors compared to survival in patients who had a signature that was downregulated in invasive tumors. And in all seven data sets, we could identify that survival was differentially um, determined based upon the presence of the invasiveness signature, which really, uh, I think, provided some robust validation of the biological and clinical impact of these signatures. Then the next question is, what is driving this process that is pathologically important and clinically important. And so to identify the key networks here, we use an integrative network modeling approach that was developed by uh, Jun Zhu, again from Semaphore. And this is constructed from taking copy number variation data, transcriptional data, and methylation data from the Cancer Genome Atlas to create this matrix structure. And on top of it, we overlaid our gene expression data. And what you can see in the squares are the major drivers of the various nodes in two major regulatory networks that I'm showing you here. On the left-hand side, I draw your attention to the main drivers, TPX2, which is a known activator of an Aurora kinase family member, Aurora kinase A, and then also another Aurora kinase member here, Aurora kinase B. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's upregulation of several genes that are associated with matrix deposition stromal activation uh, in the collagen 1A2 family, for example. So next step was to use the connectivity map where we can look and determine which small molecule inhibitors are best able to reverse the gene expression that is differentially expressed in invasive versus non-invasive tumors. And that's shown here in panel C. And what we observed was that if we look at both networks and the gene expression profiles that were contained therein, aurora kinase inhibitors were the most potent drivers of reversing our gene expression signature. We did some immunohistochemistry to evaluate the expression of aurora kinase A and B protein in our human tumors, and we were able to detect, of course, that uh, aurora kinase expression was upregulated at the protein level in the invasive tumors versus the non-invasive tumors. So then the hypothesis was that inhibition of aurora kinase signaling would impede or intercept progression of lung adenocarcinoma. So we tested this in several ways. So first, we tested this in a dish. And I'm showing you on the top right-hand side 
the results of in vitro invasion and migration and wound healing assays that we did in a variety of lung cancer cell lines using two small molecule inhibitors of aurora kinase signaling. We also did genetic, genetic knockouts of aurora kinase A and B signaling. We saw that knocking out aurora kinase A did not change the phenotype. Knocking out B did not change the phenotype. We only saw a phenotype of altering migration or invasion when we knocked out both genetically. Or if we use this pan aurora kinase small molecule inhibitor that I'm showing you here. So we were able to retard invasion, migration, and wound healing in cells. And more importantly, we took the lung cancer model that I described for you up front, and this is the KRAS TGFBR2 knockout mouse, which over time will develop growth of nodules that will metastasize, shown here on the CTs of the, the murine lungs. And then we treat the animals with the orokinase inhibitor, we're able to retard progression and increase survival of these mice just using the orokinase inhibitor to then show that inhibition of orokinase would retard progression and intercept progression and metastasis in this animal model. So then we wanted to get a better understanding about what is happening biologically in these tumors de novo and what is happening in these tumors if we're inhibiting aurora kinase signal. And I'm, I'm showing you this, this slide because I want to come back to what I shown you before, where I featured two networks that were differentially expressed in our invasive versus our indolent network. So one here is on the left, and, and then there's one, and this is mostly epithelial related genes and tumor cell related genes. But I want to focus over here on the right, where there's upregulation again of this collagen 1A2 network, which brings into focus the importance of the crosstalk and the cross signaling. And we heard about this, and Ali, Ali talked about this in, in her model of the when you abrogate or alter signaling or perturb signaling at the epithelium, it can also then result in changes in gene expression and, and protein expression in the non-epithelial tissues. Here we're talking about the matrix. We're talking about activation of fibroblasts. Same thing when we look at genes that are differentially expressed in cells that are treated with the aurora kinase inhibitor. So not only so we're, we're treating, not only are we, we treating, not only are we affecting tumor-related cells when we use the aurora kinase inhibitor, we're also affecting genes that are associated uh, with matrix deposition and fibroblast activation. So in our minds, some of the key concepts that we need to understand with more clarity are the impact of altering tumor signaling on the microenvironment. We've all seen the importance of targeting the microenvironment in altering the course of a variety of different tumors, including lung tumors. So we have a variety of different model systems to better understand this that are ongoing right now. Cold culture, of course, organized model systems, and then a single cell RNA sequencing of our animal model as well. So we'll be able to better understand how we could potentially combine treatment targeted to the microenvironment with treatment targeted to the tumor cells to better and more durably retard uh, progression and invasion of lung adenocarcinoma. So with that, I'll stop and again, recognize the individuals who did the work. So in, in my lab, Abby Sinha is our postdoc who did most of the work in, in the lab in partnership with Song Yul Yu who did the computational bioinformatics under the supervision of June and uh, also recognize Alan and Hadeo. So thank you so much. Question, Jane.
Yeah, I think it starts in the epithelium. And I, I, don't, I don't know why do I say that. So one is uh, our data uh, suggests that's the case because when we're doing our manipulations, whether it's in a dish or whether it's in even our animal model where we're targeting the adenocrete to epithelial cells, things are, it starts in the epithelium. But I also would say there's data that comes from other sources that also support this. So there's a real beautiful paper just um, about three months ago from the Brown group here with Miriam Murad, uh, where they did spatial single cell transcriptomics. And amongst the genes that were knocked out was TGFBR2. And this is, and, and so then able to precisely see in a, in a tumor model that TGFBR2 was knocked out in, in the tumor cells itself. And then we're able to see the reaction in terms of the activation of the matrix. It was called a fibromucopurulent activation program, providing additional support that the initial perturbation is in the epithelium and then the reaction is in the microenvironment. So that's, I think that's uh, the evidence to support that. So that's always been a, a, a hope to be able to minimize systemic toxicity by leveraging the fact that the airway epithelium can be reached through inhalation. So that approach works really well for some airway diseases such that are associated with inflammation, asthma, and obstructive lung disease. Um, there, have been attempts to try and use the airway to approach other diseases like cancer, and, and that hasn't shown efficacy right now. There have been efforts to try and leverage inhalation to try and deliver systemic drugs, insulin, for example, and that's had variable levels of success. So bottom line, still a lot of work to do to uh, be able to demonstrate the efficacy of that path. All right. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about our research that we're doing. Uh, I'm not a basic scientist, so I'm maybe a little bit off topic compared to the rest of the talks, but I'm looking forward to collaborating with all of you. Uh, so I'm an epidemiologist by training, and we are interested in investigating the role of the environment in disease. So what is the role of the exposure to environmental factors in, uh, in disease? That is a question that we're interested in. And we, uh, as already mentioned, New York City, we're exposed to a lot of air pollution. Uh, World Trade Center gave, uh, gave a lot of dust and exposure of a lot of New Yorkers to, uh, to uh, pollutants and carcinogens. Pesticides, chemicals, we are all well aware of those uh, type of uh, exposures, but there are more. Uh, viruses, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and HPV are known to be associated with health outcomes. Uh, pesticides that are on our food, the vegetables and uh, um, foods that we eat. We have flame retardants that are on a lot of things that we are ex uh, touching, uh, chairs, uh, anything that we don't want to catch uh, fire quickly. The forever chemicals, PFAS, that are in our water, and uh, it is well known that 99% of the New York, of the uh, U.S. population has that in their blood circulation, and then plastics that are all around. We can see that the uh, if we look at the trend of our exposures, just to name a few, um, pesticides exposure has increased uh, up till the 1980s, and then it stabilized 
However, if we compare uh, this list of, uh, I believe, 13 pesticides here that was uh, published on uh, recently, that you can see that um, while most of them are banned in Europe, they are all uh, still available and used uh, highly in the US. Um, so that's important to note. So there's still a lot of work to do. We can see that regulations do have an effect. Um, the average blood PFAS levels it decreased uh, tremendously over time due to regulations. But what happens is that they get replaced by others and we don't know the effects yet. And plastics, are we all are well aware that the global plastics production has increased exponentially over time. So we are exposed to a lot of different things. A couple of things to keep in mind when you study exposures. Um, there's of course the latency period between an exposure and the development of disease. We are not exposed to one thing at a time. It's a mixture of a lot of different things and that varies throughout the day, throughout the year, throughout your life. And there are a different uh, critical developmental periods of exposure that uh, are important um, to investigate. Uh, pregnancy, prenatal exposure, puberty, these are all uh, time frames when the impact is higher. Just to switch gears a little bit, um, we are in our lab are mainly interested in thyroid cancer and just to give you an idea why. So thyroid cancer incidence has increased uh, steadily over time. And it has been said that it has been mainly due to an increased use of diagnostic imaging. So we see more, we find more. I, the, it, it relates a little bit to what was mentioned in lung cancer. There are a lot of people that walk around with nodules and just uh, happily live till 80 without ever being diagnosed or die of that uh, disease. Um, so this study shows that if we would think that that is the theory, we would not, uh, we would think that only localized small thyroid cancers would increase. And that is not true. We can see also an increase in regional thyroid cancer are advanced and also larger tumor sizes are increasing. Um, again, if we would only find these large, these, sorry, these small low risk cancers, we would think that mortality would at least stabilize or decrease. And that's also not what we see. So we think that there might be something else that is going on as well. Um, we got really interested in this topic because we found, um, well, multiple studies found an excess risk of thyroid cancer in the World Trade Center responders. And the, again, this question was asked, is it because we just screen them, they come in for yearly checkups, um, and do we find more cancer this way? So first thing we did was an sorry, epidemiological assessment. And uh, if we would think that it is because of increased surveillance, we would think that the tumors would be smaller and they would be younger. At, up at the time of diagnosis. And that is not what we found. There was no difference when we compared this group to the Mount Sinai thyroid cancer cases. So then we did a follow-up study using a panel of uh, four molecular markers that was uh, developed by our uh, collaborators, Dr. Surudi and her team in Brazil, because we had the hypothesis that if a physician is aware of this exposure to World Trade Center dust, that they would more to avoid um, misdiagnosis, diagnose, diagnose them with cancer compared to the regular population. So we did a matched case control study using this panel as the gold standard as it is highly sensitive and specific for cancer. And we found no differences between the groups. So both, there were no false diagnosed uh, thyroid cancer cases within the World Trade Center group. Um, and then, uh, so we, we're, we continue our work within the World Trade Center group and uh, did a mutational analysis starting by uh, looking at BRF mutations and TERT promoter mutations. And we found that the group of World Trade Center thyroid cancer cases had in high, uh, and higher odds of TERT promoter mutations compared to non-exposed. So there might be uh, there, there might be something that has um, developed uh, this excess risk of thyroid cancer in this group. So we're currently in the process of publishing this group. 
So within our lab, we continue this work and um, we have an ongoing study at the moment looking at if these still in this World Trade Center group, if these World Trade Center related pollutants that were in the dust actually came all the way through the thyroid and caused cancer. And we use two different methods to look at that. Um, we collaborate with um, the Department of Environmental Medicine here at Mount Sinai, Dr. Lauren Patrick, who is an expert on metabolomics. So we're going to use um, um, stored thyroid cancer tissue to examine, again, a group of exposed to non-exposed. And um, we do a pilot study where we look at metals as they were found in the dust as well with a technique that was developed by Dr. Manish Aurora here. Secondly, we're um, looking at Agent Orange because Agent Orange was highly used in the Vietnam War and contaminated with TCDD. This is a toxic, stable, and persistent endocrine disrupting chemical and known carcinogen, which was associated with a higher thyroid cancer risk in this population. So we want to investigate if it's potentially associated with more aggressive thyroid cancer. And again, we use different techniques to look at this. Um, we will use national VA data to look at phenotypical um, differences in aggressiveness. And in collaboration with the VA uh, Medical Center in the Bronx, we use samples from their repository to look at uh, mutational patterns and methylation patterns. So the research that we're doing is highly collaborative with basic science labs throughout the institution and outside. Just want to highlight quickly uh, um, this small um, prospective study uh, using uh, th that was funded through a pilot study within, um, within Sinai using the BioMe Biobank. Uh, this is a very unique uh, program where we were able to identify and obtain plasma, plasma samples of thyroid cancer patients that had their samples collected before diagnosis, which which makes it possible to use a prospective design. And we again look at metabolomics and in this case also proteomics in, in collaboration with Dr. Dr. Singwe Kim Schultz here at Sinai um, to see if certain endocrine disrupting chemicals are associated with thyroid cancer. Just uh, to finish uh, my presentation, I want to um, bring your attention to our prospective study that we started this January, and we are uh, interested in collaborating with people that are interested in using our data. We started enrolling uh, patients that are diagnosed at, um, at Sinai with thyroid cancer before they receive their surgical treatment. Uh, we obtain blood samples, so patients can do that with this, um, this uh, blood sample collection kit at home. They can send it back to us. We collect all exposure information and their clinical and medical records data, and we follow them up in time to uh, exactly also what was mentioned to look at what do these patients, do they develop more, more invasive cancer? Do they have a recurrence of that cancer? And, and what is the effect over time to see if there's a difference, if there are certain exposures associated with more aggressive so just to summarize, uh, how do we look at the role of the environment in disease? Um, the, the goal is to combine basic science, clinical and epidemiological research um, through uh, collaborations within the institution. We are interested in um, highly risk uh, populations, so either high exposures on one end or um, uh, high incidence of disease. We focus on pollutants that are known to be associated with, in my case, the thyroid, but I think given all these presentations and the airway being exposed to a lot of these, uh, these pollutants that I'm talking about, um, this could be uh, of interest in, in, in this, this work that you're doing. And we look at not at causing the disease, but more in looking at how is it associated with disease progression, prognosis, and survival? And as you can imagine, this is a highly collaborative effort um, with a lot of people um, to, uh, to help me with this work. And I want to also mention that a lot of 
very active medical students here uh, helping out with, uh, with the projects. Uh, thank you for your attention and for any questions. Um, so what we know thus far is that prostate cancer was also increased, which is fascinating because it's, again, also not an organ that is directly exposed to the dust. It is also an endocrine organ, so there is, there might be something there. That's why I think it's very intriguing to look at that as well. So um, I'm involved in that group. Um, lung cancer thus far has not been increased. Uh, but they keep regularly updating to see if, um, as we mentioned, the latency period, if over time we see more lung cancer coming. Um, this group was relatively young, especially for the first responders when they were exposed. So we, we think that it might come a little later. Leukemia is another cancer that is coming up. Yeah, but, but I think the numbers are that low. It's relatively rare cancer. So no, that has not come up, come up yet. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, we should have had a look. Yeah, and thank you for the following up for the grants. Thank you for following up oh, with yeah. the grants. Yeah. Yeah. More stress. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, so I can just close this out now? Yeah.